Saturday night in downtown Phoenix, D-backs fans filing into Chase Field on Gerardo Parra Bobblehead Day. And there is the honoree himself sitting out tonight against the left-hander Clayton Kershaw. Parra Bobblehead Day, Dodgers and D-backs on a noteworthy and newsworthy day here at Chase Field. Good afternoon from Chase Field. Welcome to the broadcast. Eve Berthium and Bob Renly along the way. Big doings here at the ballpark today as Tony La Russa, Hall of Famer to be Tony La Russa, was introduced as the D-backs new chief baseball officer. He will oversee all baseball operations and report to D-backs president and CEO Derek Hall. Basically, Bob, he has uh, been given the keys to the store here. Any baseball decision now goes through Tony La Russa. And uh, it seems right because Tony La Russa has been around this game for a long time, over 5,000 games as a manager, three-time World Series champion. I mean, this guy's seen it all, done it all, and uh, he's been involved with some really successful organizations. One thing about the game of baseball, it would very quickly teach you how to lose. But guys that can figure out a way to win consistently, those are the guys you want in your organization. Tony La Russa certainly fits that bill. Tony La Russa, a great competitor over 33 seasons as a manager, said he missed the winning and losing, and now he is in charge of the Diamondbacks front office. Here he is earlier today. I woke up this morning for the first time since the, uh, uh, the day that the, the retirement was announced, which was the Monday after the 2011 season. It's the first day I woke up and I felt the difference uh, because for the first time since then, you're back with an organization uh, and at the end of the day, you're going to be judged by how well your contribution is to the organization's con competition. And one important note here, this is something that Tony La Russa wanted. Chuck Armstrong earlier this winter retired as the president of the Seattle Mariners, and La Russa was a candidate before that job. They chose to promote from within, but now Tony La Russa, Bob, got what he wanted. He's back in charge. And I don't know how much you can do any better than that unless you get uh, Joe Torre and Bobby Cox also before they induct them into the Cooperstown Hall of Fame. One byproduct of this is the Diamondbacks will get a mention at Cooperstown this year. <laughs> so that's a good thing. Well, it's, uh, it's an exciting day, certainly here for Diamondback fans. Tony La Russa introduced Gerardo Parra bobblehead day, and it's Chase at Chase. Chase Anderson, his second big league start, is first in front of his D-back hometown fans, and it comes in against Clayton Kershaw. First pitch coming up.
Sports Arizona is brought to you in part by CenturyLink, your link to what's next. And by Jack in the Box. If the D-backs hit a home run today, score a free Jumbo Jack tomorrow with a purchase of a large drink. Welcome back to Chase Field. Cindy Brunson with you as we count down to the first pitch between the Dodgers and the Diamondbacks. It will be Chase Anderson on the bump for the D-backs as he guns to win his second major league game. Of course, he was spectacular in Sunday's outing, his first major league victory. It was Mother's Day, and it couldn't have gone any better for the rookie. Five and a third strong, just one earned, struck out six, and he did it in front of friends and family, including his mom, and he is beyond excited to face a guy he knows pretty well in Clayton Kershaw today. You see, they both hail from the state of Texas and came oh so close to meeting in high school playoffs competition, but it didn't quite work out as Chase's team came up short. Well, he'll get the opportunity to get the better of his fellow Texan in the Texas two-step. First pitch is coming up. Steve Berthume and Bob Brindley have the call. Here is Chase Anderson, the rookie, walking out to a major league mound for just the second time in his career. He said about his big league debut last weekend in Chicago against the White Sox that he was definitely nervous. But after the first pitch, he was able to calm down and say, OK, it's the same game. And just go from there. And boy, Bob, did it work out well. It really did. And uh, he came as advertised. Tremendous straight change up. He showed a real good curve ball. He was able to keep his fastball out of the middle of the plate, which is a good formula against any opponent. Well, he's up there against a tough lineup tonight. The Dodgers have scored at least six runs in nine of their last 13 games here at Chase Field. All Dodger wins, and their big bats will be in there against the rookies. It's a look at our entire pro starting lineup. So Don Man and they will line him up tonight. D. Gordon at the top, obviously a stolen base threat, a huge lead in the major stolen base category. Yasi up week batting second. Henry Ramirez in the third spot. Adrian Gonzalez over at first base batting cleanup. Followed by Matt Kemp and Carl Crawford, Juan Uribe, A.J. Ellis, and Clayton Kershaw, the lefty on the mound for the Dodgers. Their Arizona Ford starting pitcher is Chase Anderson. There you see him writing some initials uh, in the dirt for some relatives he has lost. His father, Robert, who raised him, a pair of grandparents. He says he writes their names in the dirt before every start. He says, I know they are watching every game I pitch. First pitch to D. Gordon. We're underway Saturday in downtown Phoenix. It's in there for a strike. 
Hey, Gordon at 315 on the year, leading the majors with 25 stolen bases. He's been caught only three times. A little flare in a shallow center. Gordon's aboard. Immediate trouble for Chase Anderson, who will now pitch from the stretch for the first time as a major leaguer. Yeah, he did give up a hit uh, to Jose Abreu in Chicago last week. He was thrown out at second trying to stretch it into a double. He gave up a home run and immediately walked the next batter with four pitches and came out of the game without ever having to throw out of the stretch. And he'll deal with the ACL Puig. Puig third in the league and hitting at 333. He is third and on base percentage at 422. The OPS right there, second in the National League behind only Troy Tulowitzki. He maintains his National League lead in neon jewelry once again tonight. <laughs> well, it worked in last night's series opener, three for five, including a double and a home run. Gordon off first. It gets behind tough. He goes a wish, and Gordon will get a free 90 feet. Puig will already see more pitches in his first at bat tonight than he did in the ball game last night. <laughs> like a two seamer that was supposed to be on that outside corner misses badly all the way across the plate, pushing Puig out of that right handed batter's box a little bit. Tuffy had to run all the way to the backstop to get to it. Looks like Chase yanked that one a little bit. It scored a wild pitch. Gordon stands at second base. 1 0 to Puig. I mentioned Puig with five ABs last night. Saw one pitch in three of those at bats. Saw five pitches in another and three in another. Play on at second. It kicks off the bag, it looks like. But Chris Owings able to corral that. It's an Owings Pennington middle infield combination. Aaron Hill was a late scratch. Looked like I might have caught a piece of D. Gordon out there at second base. Hit him on the back of that right elbow. He's got the oven mitts on to protect his hands and wrists as he slides into bases, but no fingers for D. Gordon on the base pass. Can't break anything that way. He's got a 10 steals lead over the next closest, Eric Young of the Mets. One ball, no strikes to Gassiel Puy. Boy, one thing we learned about D. Gordon uh, from earlier this season, you always have to keep your head up when he's on the bases. He's a very alert base runner, besides being tremendously fast. He'll watch the infielders if they have their heads down or they turn their back to the play and he feels like he can advance. He might take off at any time. We always hear the kids got to go out there talking about Chase Anderson and slow the game down. Does this accelerate things for Chase? Oh, no question. I mean, you've got a, a proven base dealer on to start the ball game. You uncork a wild pitch immediately putting him into scoring position for a guy that's batting 412 with runners in scoring position. Heartbeats getting up there a little bit as Quig shows button takes his crank. Mentioned in his outing against the White Sox, he was able to keep the fastball out of the middle of the plate. He really did a nice job of either hitting the corners or missing farther in his favor. If he went to the top of the zone, he missed up above the letters. Rarely did he make a mistake in the middle of the plate with a fastball. It's Puig way out in front. It's two and two. This is Chase Anderson's calling card this time the big slow curveball, but his best pitch and his swing and miss pitch is that straight changeup. Chase Anderson great confidence in his stuff. He has trusted it all year long at double A mobile and in one start with the Diamondbacks. He throws that curveball for strikes when he needs to and really has shown a true three pitch mix fastball change and curve. And when he's got that fastball command and works off that, the curveball for strikes, mixing in the change in any county is going to pitch well. Two and two to Puy Gordon on second. It's full. And Le Ramirez is on deck. Dodger bats that's been quiet as of late. Puig has the hottest bat in the lineup, hitting nearly 430 during what is now a 15-game hitting streak. 
He has hit in every game this month. Got him. Is that a case, Bob, of trusting your stuff? Well, that's all Chase Anderson knows. Uh, we mentioned that's his best pitch. That's his swing and miss pitch, his strikeout pitch, especially when you spot it like that below the knees on that outside corner. Very tough to get to that pitch. Most hitters are going to start that bat early when they see the arm speed, and the ball just doesn't seem to ever get to the plate. Able to throw that pitch in a three and two count to the hottest hitter in the game, and now Hanley steps in. At 252 and five homers. Ramirez on base twice last night. A walk at an RBI double. He scored a run. Gordon at second after a single and a wild pitch. A lot of breaking stuff. A lot of off speed stuff early to these Dodger hitters. Seems like a Bronson Arroyo approach. We've seen those two hang out a lot together over the last week. Pass balls in there quickly 0 and 2. Confidence he showed it in the Mother's Day start in Chicago. Never looked uncomfortable out there looked to be in control poised in a rhythm. Not overmatched by his circumstance or surroundings. In the glove of Prado at third, Gordon is back in time. Sounded like D. Gordon broke his bat to start the ball game, and now Hanley Ramirez with a little broken bat floater to Martin Prado at third. Good reaction that time by D. Gordon to hustle back into the bag at second, avoiding the double play. So now Chase Anderson needs an out here to strand that leadoff single. Gordon at second after the wild pitch, and he'll work to Adrian Gonzalez. 258 and nine homers. Gonzalez hitless last night. He did walk twice. Even though Gonzalez is struggling a little bit lately, this is a guy that the Diamondbacks definitely have on their radar over the last two seasons. 28 ball games, 27 runs driven in, seven homers, a 388 average, and with runners in scoring position carrying a 414 average. So Adrian Gonzalez, regardless of what he's done against other teams coming into this series, his name is circled on that lineup card. A thorn in the D back side, no question, but he's had a very poor month of May. The 1 0. So far this month, Gonzalez has hit a buck 55. He's got four RBIs in 15 games in May. He hit 320 in April with eight home runs. So a big drop off come the first of May. Two balls and no strikes. This is there, 3 0. Quinn Wolcott is the plate umpire. And stumbled, lost his footing, and bounced it up there. So Gonzalez gets the four pitch walk. And it's first and second, two down for Matt Kemp. A stumble there on the mound. And Tuffy goes to wish Paul Goldschmidt out to check on the young right hander. Caught his heel as he was swinging that left foot forward to land in that hole out in the front of the mound. Lost his balance. Nice job by Tuffy to stay in front of that one and keep Gordon at second base. What's this conversation? You know, 
first inning is probably a little bit too early to walk a guy intentionally, especially when Gonzalez has been struggling recently the way he has. But this does give you the righty on righty matchup. Gives you a force at any base in the infield. I'm sure that was a message Tuffy gave to Chase Anderson out there. Hey, you're in good shape here. You're fine. Pitch that guy carefully. Let's get right back in the zone here against Matt Kemp. Kemp at 266 and five homers. This is with a fastball up. It's 1 0. Camp 0 for 5 last night. That snapped a six game hit streak. But he is one of the hot bats in this lineup. On the ground is short. Owens goes to Pennington and Chase Anderson strands two just underway here at. Well, let's call it Chase Field. Tony LaRusa named the Diamondbacks new chief baseball officer. He will oversee the entire baseball operations department. So everybody wants to look good on the first day under the new regime. The evaluation period underway, and this is a look at the Tire Pro starting lineup for Kirk Gibson. AJ Pollock in that leadoff spot tonight. You see he's hitting eight of his last nine, carrying a 367 average over that time with four extra base hits. Chris Owens batting second. Paul Goldschmidt in his customary three spot. Cody Ross moves up into the cleanup spot. Martin Prado at third base. Alfredo Marte in right field. Cliff Bennington filling in for Aaron Hill at second base tonight. Tuffy Goswish doing the catching for right hander Chase Anderson. Your Arizona Ford starting pitcher is Clayton Kershaw. He started the opener against the D-backs in Sydney, but then went 45 days before his next start. That because of a strained muscle located right behind his pitching shoulder. He didn't get back until May the 6th, and tonight makes just his third start since returning from the DL. A.J. Pollock leads it off. First pitch swing and skies it to center for Kemp. One pitch, one out for Kershaw. After Kershaw last two times out, a win and a no decision. Each time he went seven innings, each time he struck out nine, each time he didn't walk a bat. It's amazing. And both his starts since the return from injury, nine strikeouts, no walks. The only other Dodger since 1914 to do that in back-to-back -back starts was Dazzy Vance. Chris Owings in the two-hole tonight. Kirk Gibson had to do a little... Late shuffling of the lineup when Aaron Hill was scratched. And so CO moves up into the two hole. And Cliff Pennington takes over at second base. Aaron got a little shoulder. Nothing big, but he just gets a day. Last four starts at Chase Field. Winless with an ERA over four. They've had a lot harder time, Bob, with. Ryu and Granky, it seems, than they have with Kershaw. Yeah, it's hard to figure. Clayton Kershaw, one of the best in the game. 
led the majors in ERA each of the last three seasons. I mean, it just goes on and on. Won his second Cy Young Award last year. Back in 2011, the pitching triple crown wins ERA and strikeouts. I mean, there's not much this man has not accomplished out there on the mound, but the Diamondbacks have done all right against him recently. He gets Owings out in front. A.J. Ellis completes the strikeout. Two down. Here's Goldie. Paul Goldschmidt, 311, seven homers. And Goldie hitless last night. He struck out three times, and he's slumping right now. Bob, I don't think we've seen him since you and I have been here. The struggle like he has over the last week. Yeah, swinging at uh, borderline pitches, at times bad pitches. Looks like occasionally he gets caught guessing, takes some fastballs right down the middle of the plate, swings through pitches that we've seen him hit hard before. And certainly Goldie's a guy that takes a lot of responsibility onto his own shoulders. He wants to be in that lineup every day, whether he's swinging the bat well or not. There's other ways to help your team win ball games, and I think Goldie feels like he can do that defensively. He can do it on the bases. He can do it with his leadership in that dugout, but sure love to see him get that bat going again. Owls that one back. It's a ball and two strikes. Yeah, Goldie up there now, just three for his last 26. He has gone without a base hit in five of his last seven games. He does have a homer in his career against Kershaw. He's down a ball and two strikes. Kershaw wanted it. Hold on, Clayton. It's two and two. Win woke at the plate umpire. Got him. Two strikeouts in the inning for Kershaw. Coming up next, Tony LaRusa, the new D backs chief baseball officer, joins us in the booth when we come back. Here at Chase Field, Hall of Famer to be Tony La Russa introduced as the Diamondbacks' new Chief Baseball Officer. First of all, congratulations. Thank you. What does this mean? It means I'm excited again when I wake up in the morning because uh, there's a game that night and it matters whether you win or lose. And uh, I'm very appreciative that the Diamondbacks, you know, they're an outstanding organization and they're willing to try something a little different, put somebody that has an idea or experience about competing and sharing it with the different pieces of the organization. What was your first contact with the Diamondbacks front office and tell us about the process. What was it like. How did it go. Well, it turned out to be a coincidence because they called about where was I. And I said well I'm in your place next day because I came in to see. Uh, came in to see. The ball up and then. Did I miss that. Max Carl Crawford off the plate. 
See, as soon as you get in here, things get feisty. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I was coming in to see Colorado and the Diamondbacks because, uh, you know, I know Walt really well. And I talk a lot of baseball with him, and he said, well, we'd like to talk to you. And then they explained that they were, you know, I knew they were struggling and trying to wonder what was going on. And so once the initial discussions happened, uh, how did things proceed from there? Well, I know that they had done it up front and they had talked to uh, Kevin and they had talked to, to Kirk. There's one thing I'd always learned. You never talk about somebody's job while they're there, but I wasn't here for a general manager or a, a manager job. So that became all right. And, uh, and I knew that both of those guys are veteran champions and, and, and they were they knew they were struggling and they were honest about what you know what's going to be done. And I think the organization was very upfront with them that they were going to look at alternatives and as it turned out, the alternative turned out to be just somebody that is going to do some uh, try, hope to help competing throughout the organization. How will this challenge be different than managers? Oh, with Pennington. <laughs> a great play. Pennington in there for Aaron Hill, who was scratched right before game time with a sore shoulder. And uh, we've seen Penny do this repeatedly, whether it's at second base or shortstop. Occasionally over at third base, covers a lot of ground, always makes an accurate throw, whether it's from his feet or his knees. Are you prepared, Tony, for the differences? I know you haven't started yet, so you don't really know in large part what they are. But what about the differences, managing and then running an operations department? Uh, it really is uh, the great unknown and I know in one of the first meetings Ken asked that you know when you manage you're taking whatever you've been taught and you're applying it directly to your players and working with your coaching staff and other members of the staff. This one here is you may have an idea you know maybe that backhand play you know maybe there is something that you've been taught that would make that backhand play differently. Well how do you communicate that to the infield coach mm -hmm. the manager and, and that's going to be a, a challenge but I really feel like if you know what the priorities are and you go through the right steps that you can contribute it and maybe you find out that the way they're doing it is better. So I, I do think that that's a real challenge. Where do you begin. Um, I think you have to do the uh, the priorities thing if it's urgent. Like if somebody said you could you should really have an opinion about who you draft in June then you got to get out and see some of the players. If you're talking about improving the organization in an area or two then you need to have some patience you need to gather information. Mm -hmm. well, your reputation as a manager is uh, for a guy that was a stickler for detail don't leave anything uh, to the unknown you want your players to be as prepared as they can possibly be. How do you transmit that to a, to a new organization. That's a great question Skipper. Uh, I, I think I think you have to understand that it all starts with the competition of the game. And one of the things that kind of bothered me a little bit was that we would say we were a prepared club. That's just like studying for the test. The key is do you take the test? So we would take our preparation into the game. So what you want to do is, you know, a lot of the the games may be won in a big way or, or, or lost in a big way. But there are a lot of key games that the simple execution or lack of cost your wins for you. So you need to pay attention to details. That one of the guys that I played for that was really, really impactful was Dick Williams. And you look at his career, he managed two world champions uh, with the A's and got to the Padres to the world championship. Uh, Dick was really a stickler for playing the game correctly. I mean, to the point where if you didn't play correctly, you're you going to hear from him and you probably wouldn't play. A lot of speculation, Tony. I need to ask you this about Kirk Gibson and Kevin Towers. How will you proceed in discussions with them and evaluating your manager and your GM? Well, I've, I've actually talked to Kirk at length this morning or this afternoon. I haven't had a good chance with Kevin yet, but the one thing we all we all understand, you know, this is the big leagues, and you have to play to the big league standard. You got to manage the big league standard. You got to general manage the big. League. You got to be a baseball officer of the big league standard. So I mean, these guys are proven champions. And the number one thing I I, I was hoping, and, and I heard from from uh, from Gibby, I mean, he's every bit into it. He didn't discourage. He's not defeated. He just disappointed as the team is. So uh, I really think the smartest thing is to uh, work with him. And if there's an observation about something that uh, Maybe I had heard or learned, and I'll, I'll, I'll pass it along to him and see how he takes it. And I, he's very open to learning, and uh, we'll go from there. But I really would like 
to uh, to spend a good bit of time giving Kevin and and <laughs> things are looking good with you up here. Tony LaRusse of the Diamondbacks new chief baseball officer overseeing baseball operations. Congratulations and thanks for coming by. They don't have to worry about learning how to make their play. That's good. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, Kershaw does a great job of slowing or stopping completely the opposing running game. Not that the Diamondbacks run a lot, but he's very quick to home plate when he goes that direction. He showed that quick step off move to first base. Very tough to get a jump against him. He's still looking for a balk with that motion. <laughs> <laughs> looks like two stops to me. Close. That straight raising of the glove directly over his head, and then he's supposed to come set when he comes back down near the belt, right? Yeah, but it looks to me like he stops there and then starts again. Picky, picky. Oh. Always looking for an edge, something to get between <laughs> his ears. And Balk has to be an attempt to deceive the base runner. Look at that. We mentioned now if you count the first two strikeouts in the first, 27 strikeouts for the year, and now two walks. We won't find much better than that. That's why he gets the big bucks. Hey fans, when the D-backs win, you win at Papa John's. The day after every Diamondbacks win, you get 50% off your regular order. <laughs> Your regular menu price online order at Papa John's. Enter promo code DBAX50 at PapaJohns.com. I read that every day. You'd think I would have it down by now. It's live TV. You're all right. We're all being evaluated. I'm nervous. <laughs> Two and one. I think you're going to pass. <laughs> 94 by Prano. Two balls and two strikes. I should point out Kershaw throws that fastball in the low to mid 90s. Throws a curveball and a slider. Doesn't really use the straight changeup very often anymore. It was a pitch that he used earlier in his career, but now goes to one of two breaking pitches for his off speed delivery. Side Martin Prado found a real hard spot, bounced this one over the head of Adrian Gonzalez, just fair down into that right field corner. A walk and a single to open up the inning. Here's Alfredo Marte, the right fielder tonight. Roof and panels are closed here, 100 degrees outside. There is a chance we'll open things up as we get later into the ball game. Quickly 0 and 1. Marte a pinch hit single against Zach Greinke on a hanging curveball last night. He's 5 for 13 this year. This is his fourth start. Strike. One thing about Kershaw, if he falls behind in the count, two and zero, oh, three and one, even full count, he's likely to challenge with the fastball. But his command is so good, it's not like he's just tossing cookies in there for hitters to take a swing at. Even when he's behind in the count, he throws to the corners. That's the downtown swing we've seen from Marte throughout this season. One of these days he's going to make contact on one of these swings. And it's going to go. Well, we've seen that swing quite a bit. It hasn't really produced much in the way of uh, offensive thunder. But his swing with two strikes has been very short, very quick, and has produced some offense. He's got two strikes right here. Two and two. This is up. Yeah, curveball's up. Trying to drop it in there on him. Cody Ross, the runner at third. Martin Prado at first. He waves 
at that one, one down. Three strikeouts for Kershaw. Tight rotation on that big curveball. Very easy for a right-handed hitter to quit on that pitch. It looks like it's going to be up and away, and then takes the break and drops right in there. Have no fear, Larusa is here. The signs here at Chase Field, a packed house. D-backs and Dodgers as Cliff Pennington steps in. Cliff Pennington getting the start at second base this afternoon. Aaron Hill was scratched from the lineup with a sore right shoulder. And so Pennington is in there for the first time since last Sunday in Chicago. It's been almost a week since uh, Cliff has had an at bat. Strike one. Yeah, Penny showing bunt right there for a base hit. That's not a sacrifice bunt. Ended up taking that pitch. A called strike in the estimation of Quinn Walcott. This is a situation that I really like to play hit and run. Mm -hmm. Stay out of the double play. Start that runner. You got a guy at the plate that handles the bat extremely well. Worst thing that can happen here is a double play ball. So if you start that runner at first, it takes away the possibility of that double play if Penny can put the ball in play on the ground. Now at what point in the count do you lose that opportunity? Right now. You really don't play hit and run with two strikes. Some guys uh, are a little more adept than others at putting that ball in play in a two strike count. But against a tough cookie like Kershaw, once you get to two strikes, uh, Cliff's just going to have to go to battle up there. Texans going head to head here. Cliff born in Corpus Christi, Texas. Kershaw from Highland Park. 0 and 2. This is in the air, and this should get down. It rolls to the wall. Cody Ross will score. Here comes Prado, and Penny is wheels up at third. Strike first, it's 2 0. Like any good pitcher, you have to be prepared to take advantage of mistakes, and Clayton Kershaw is more likely to make a mistake with that big curve ball than any of his other pitches. That time, hung run up and out over the plate to Cliff Pennington. He's already in defensive mode with two strikes. You see that hanger up in your eyes. Ready to swing at that pitch. So if he goes a wish. And another run is 90 feet away and come on down. RBI number four for Tuffy. His first start in about two weeks, and it's three zip Diamondbacks. He jumped on the first one from Kershaw. Infield was cheating in, he snuck it into left. Took advantage of that drawn in infield. Didn't hit this ball particularly hard, but hit it in a good spot. You could see some splinters flying up there in that right-handed batter's box as he made contact, but with Uribe well in on the grass, and Hanley Ramirez in front of the baseline. That one sneaks through for an RBI hit. A walk, a single, a triple, and a single for the Diamondbacks against Kershaw. And Chase Anderson does a nice job of moving Tuffy along. And a chance now for A.J. Pollock with another run in scoring position and two down. Center fielder, A.J. Pollock. And this is just like Chase's start at Chicago where the Diamondbacks got him an early lead. And it was a 10-pitch first for Kershaw. This is his 20th pitch in this inning.
Kershaw had been consistently missing up with that curveball, ultimately hung that one to Cliff Pennington for the RBI triple. See if he starts to go to that slider a little bit more. There's one right there. Yeah, sometimes when one breaking ball isn't working early in the game, and certainly it doesn't look like Kershaw has a good feel for that curveball, you go to plan B, which for Clay Kershaw would be that hard slider in the high 80s. It's funny, there was a point in his career where those two pitches kind of blended into one as they so often do. Right over the head of Glenn Sherlock at third. Park today. They're making a lot of noise with a three run Diamondback second. And Pollock trying to add to it right here. When Kershaw first broke into the big leagues, the pitch that got him noticed, other than the mid 90s fastball, was that's a 12 6 curveball, but it was never consistent enough to truly dominate. Walks were up, the pitch counts were up too, couldn't really command it. And he had never ever thrown a slider. And the Dodgers suggested, hey, why don't you try the slider? Well, guess what? He picked it up pretty quick. <laughs> and it has become an instant weapon for him. Foul and straight back, still two and two. And that's now his number two pitch. It's you know, less frequent, tighter curveball has made that pitch more effective for him as well. And that's just part of the evolution of Clayton Kershaw. Pennington, however, put one out there at the 413 mark. Dodgers outfield once again. Long run just to get to this ball by the time Crawford gets it back into Hanley Ramirez. AJ Pollock is in at third base with his third triple of the year. The second Diamondback triple in this inning. And it's four zip. Chris Owings fouls the first one back. Cody Ross walked to lead off the second. Prado chopped one over the head of Gonzalez at first, sending Ross to third after Marte struck out. It's been a Pennington two run triple, a Gozowish RBI single, Anderson a sacrifice bunt moving Gozowish to second, and Pollock an RBI triple. 4 0 D backs. Hey fans, anytime the D-backs score six runs or more, Taco Bell is giving away three free tacos with the purchase of a large drink between four and six the following day at participating locations. These guys are tired from running around the bases. Oh, he might be something up here, Bob. We had a very successful top of the second with Tony LaRussa in our TV booth. He has now moved to next door talking to the governor and Tom Candiotti and the Diamondbacks have come up with four in their half of the inning. So that's the LaRussa effect. It's immediate. Put a headset on him. Can't lose. Two and one to Chris Owings. Out of play. Look at Kershaw. This is more runs allowed in this inning than any of his previous five starts this year. About to throw his 30th in the inning. And the only guy.
guy who hasn't batted yet here in the second is Paul Goldschmidt. He's on deck. Two balls and two strikes. It's full. I like this. It's a lot more fun. <laughs> And on a day where Kirk Gibson sat most of his big lefty bats no Montero in there no par on his bobblehead day this D-backs lineup is struck for four in the second. Make it five. That one will roll into the corner and Chris Owens will head for third. How about three triples in one inning. Is in effect. We well, had to go down and dig that one out. A fastball down there below the knees. Matt Kemp had some issues out there on the warning track, corralling that one. And with Chris Owen's speed, any misplay whatsoever is going to result in an extra 90 feet. Clayton Kershaw has a headache. It's a triple ballpark, and the Diamondbacks have tripled three times in the second against the reigning NL Cy Young winner. And here's Goldie, the ninth man up in the inning. Join the parade. And he struck out his first time. Ball one. And we've said it all inning long. There's another run standing 90 feet away. Five runs on five hits and a walk. The triplets club Pennington Pollock and Owings who stands at third there they all are. Two and one to Goldie. Goldie right now three for twenty seven. Rosenblatt pouncing on that one down the left field line for Golden Glover. Barry Zins manning right field today. There's Sid. Barry locked in. That's a game face. It's a six run inning against Clayton Kershaw. We're going to get you tacos, BB, in one inning against the reigning Cy Young guy. Wow. Well, Goldie's double feeds on another hanging curveball that appeared. They're about belt high out over the plate. Nice adjustment by Goldie to way back, let that ball get deep in the zone and still keep it fair down that third baseline. Hey, you're supposed to be at third. <laughs> Last time the Diamondbacks had three triples in one inning, April of 2012. That was the last time there were three triples in one inning. Houston did it. Diamondbacks just did it for the first time ever.
1 0 to Cody Ross, who started off this inning with a walk. He came in and scored on a Pennington triple. So, for the first time in their history, the D backs have tripled three times in one inning. It's the first time the major leagues have seen this since the 2012 Astros. And the Dodger bullpen is busy. The veteran Jamie Wright. 2 0 to Ross. He's just not going to throw Cody a strike today. It's a universal sign from a manager to a catcher. Go out there and talk to him and stall for a little bit of time. Jamie Wright needs a few more warm up pitches in that right field bullpen. He's working on a 40 pitch inning. The Diamondbacks have been looking and looking hard for a way to turn their luck around against these Dodgers. LA has won 15 of the last 19. They won last night 7 0. But the D backs turning the tide. To Bach. Yeah, it is. They will send Goldie to third. What else could go wrong in the game for Kershaw? And now finally he's at third. That's where he's <laughs> supposed to be. I mean, get with the program here. Ball four. Ross walks for the second time in the inning. Very funny cut and Don Mattingly. If not now, when? Have no fear. Larusa is here, and here comes Don Mattingly. That is it for Kershaw. Clayton Kershaw, the reigning National League Cy Young winner, a six run second. He's responsible for two more. He'll throw only 50 pitches today, and it's bye bye Kershaw. He leaves after only one and two thirds. Thirds. He has given up six runs, responsible for two more base runners, and he's been replaced by the veteran Jamie Wright. And on this Armed Forces Day, Fox Sports Supports is especially proud to recognize the Army's Gold Star Pin Campaign, which honors the families of fallen service members. To learn more, visit goldstarpins.com. Clayton Kershaw's shortest outing ever was one and a third. And it was back May 4th of 2010. So this is the second shortest outing of Clayton Kershaw's illustrious career. And this is Jamie Wright on for the 21st time this season. Now a lot of things have happened in this inning. All of them are pretty surprising. Clayton Kershaw giving up six runs so far. Six hits in the inning. Four of those went for extra bases. And 
He's walked Cody Ross twice in this ball game. Cody had one walk on the season coming into play tonight. And still some work to do here for Wright with Goldie at third and Cody at first. Martin Prado singled and scored his first time. Different look from the right hander Jamie Wright heavy sinker hard slider tries to keep everything down in the zone get some ground balls. There's the strike one and one. Prado, the 11th man to bat in this inning. Bounced in the left. Goldie scores. 7 0 D backs. Two hits in the inning for Prado. Today's cold hard facts brought to you by Frost Brew Coors Lights. First three games. And tonight, what a contrast. Absolutely. It happens to the best of them. Obviously, didn't have his curve ball in the early going. Made some mistakes, hung it up over the middle of the plate. Tried to go to the slider, had trouble commanding that pitch. And when you're down to all fastballs, I, I don't care who you're pitching against, they're going to have a good chance to get to you. Alfredo Marte, a strikeout victim his first time against Kershaw. Seven runs, seven hits, two walks, and a balk. All in this half inning. And they've staked Chase Anderson to a 7 0 lead in his second major league start. The 1 0. Up the middle. A little late to Hanley Ramirez. He flips to Gordon for the force on Prado. But the D backs get seven in the second. It's chin up time for Chase. Three triples in one inning for the first time in the Diamondbacks' history. It's Pennington, it's Pollock, it's Owings, and it's 7 0. Diamondbacks get seven in the second, and they knock Clayton Kershaw out of the ball game. And for the first time in their history, they hit three triples in one inning. They send 12 men to the plate, and to top it off, Jamie Wright has to lead off the inning. He lines one right to Prado. Not only do you have to pull Kershaw and put in Wright, but Wright has to lead off the inning. Second baseman. 
I guess Don Madden they could have uh, pulled a double switch somewhere there at the bottom of the order. We know he has an overabundance of outfielders available. Juan Uribe at third base, uh, the seven hitter in the lineup. Of course, A.J. Ellis just back off the DL. They're probably not going to flip out their catcher this early in the ballgame. D. Gordon singled his first time. And we'll see how a 7 nothing lead relaxes Chase Anderson. Who always looks poised and calm out there, but he's got to be feeling a whole lot more confident now leading 7-zip. How much, Bob, do you think that changes things for him. I know it's not going to change make him do anything differently but it's got to ease whatever tension there was certainly. Yeah it gives you a little margin for error obviously if push comes to shove and you find yourself in a fastball count throw a fastball for a strike. You know, Dodgers uh, need to generate a lot of offense to get back in this one trailing seven to nothing and the worst thing that Chase Anderson could do would be to nibble around and walk some guys and create the opportunity for a big inning. More than anything else, it just makes you more aggressive in the strike zone. Well, Kevin Towers said what most impressed him about Chase's approach against the White Sox was the way he attacked the strike zone. And the White Sox lineup, that's not Scruffy McScrufferson in there. They got some thumpers, some big guys who hit the ball a long way. The chase in that start brought his fastball with him, wasn't afraid to challenge hitters and come inside, didn't try to just nibble on the outer half. He pitched inside outside both halves of the plate. And he's 2 2 on Gordon with a one out in the third. Well, once through the lineup plus one hitter now in D Gordon. And Chase Anderson has had three 0 2 counts in his ball game. Speaking to, to what you're talking about. Just go after him. Quality strikes on the edges of the zone. To the major league stolen base leader who's on base for the second time today. Second walk issued by Anderson. Chase walked just one in that start against the White Sox. Customary greeting for Yassiel Puig. Puig, a strikeout victim his first time. It did seem down the final portions of last year that opposing teams had found a weakness in attacking this guy, which was throw him hard fastballs in, 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 get ahead in the count, and then watch him chase breaking balls away in the dirt. Well, that has really stopped working as often as it did last year. He's kind of caught on to that. Yeah, Puig was very predictable last year. I mean, very explosive and at times extremely exciting, but very predictable. to left center and gone way out of here Puig's ninth and the Dodgers have answered at 7 2 up onto the terrace in left center field Way too good a pitch to a notorious first ball swinger. We mentioned in five ABs last night, he swung at the first pitch three times and absolutely satellites this one out into the second deck out there in left center field. Immediately comes back. Yeah, our fan out there wasted no time. There was no hesitation. Well, should I keep it? It's a home run ball after all. Nope. I've seen catchers that don't make that quick of an exchange. <laughs> Hanley Ramirez. Nice work right there. I, I, you know what, Bob? That might be contract worthy. I, I, I like the attitude. It's an intangible. Oh, I'm with you. Well, you got thumbs up from the brass here in the booth. Two thumbs up. Is that a two year contract? Oh, you're going to give him the extra year, huh? <laughs> Club option. A home run by Puig. Now he's behind Ramirez, 2-0. Oh. Hit well to center, A.J. Defensive run saved. One of the defensive metrics in which people who do such things analyze 
defensive play, and they say that A.J. Pollock, as of right now, is the best defensive center fielder in all the major leagues. He has some range. Adrian Gonzalez walked his first time. So Yasiel Puig with that homer and RBIs. Now eight straight games with at least one extra base hit and one RBI. Last major leaguer to do that, the Rays, Evan Longoria, September of 09. It's been a while. Puig began the day seven straight games with at least an extra base hit and an RBI. That was a Dodger record, which tied him with Pedro Guerrero. Now he's got the record all by himself. And he is the first player on any team to do that since Longoria back in September of 09. Sky to left should be an easy play for Cody. Anderson out of the inning, but the Dodgers get two on the Puig homer. It's 7-2 D-backs. Competitor, you know, he's, he does everything he can to try to, to win. And also, he's always been a guy who's been at least from the outside perceived as somebody who thought outside the box a bit and did some things in a different way and always seemed to turn out positive, which is great because um, you just don't have a lot of those guys in baseball because this game has, has been has always been passed down generation to generation and, and, it, and hasn't changed a whole lot. And sometimes you need some different thinkers to come in and shake things up a little bit. Bronson Arroyo sharing those thoughts before the game about the Diamondbacks' new chief baseball officer, Tony La Russa. And fellas, to a man in the clubhouse, everybody was surprised about the news. Nobody knew this was coming. And it's just a credit to the stealth operatives who were in charge of the show <laughs> in Derek Hall and Ken Kendrick. Back to you. Well, you're absolutely right, Cindy. I mean, B.B., when you're talking Tony La Russa and you're going to in a baseball operation sense, give him the keys to the store. Uh, how do you keep that quiet? That's that's really well done. <laughs> I mean, this guy's about to be inducted in the Baseball Hall of Fame. That'll take place uh, the last weekend in July this summer. It doesn't surprise me that the players were unaware. I mean, they're so focused on what they have to do every day, getting through their routine pregame, trying to put together good at bats as hitters, good innings as pitchers. Rarely do they get involved with stuff like that. Well, Cliff Pennington picks up where the D backs left off after that seven run second. Pennington so far has got a triple and a single. Tony La Russa, 33 seasons as a manager with the White Sox, the A's, and the Cardinals, three World Series rings. He and Sparky Anderson, the only managers to win World Series championships in both leagues. The resume is impeccable and just elected to the National Baseball Hall of Fame by the Expansion Era Committee. He'll go in with 
Other former skippers Bobby Cox and Joe Torrey among others. But now a whole new role chief baseball officer. And he will oversee the entire baseball operations department of the Arizona Diamondbacks and report to president and CEO Derek Hall. And the period of evaluation begins. Tuffy and RBI single his first time. Let's take a look at our Valley Honda keys to the game tonight. Some changes to the lineup for Kirk Gibson. Trust the killer bees. These guys that sit on the bench and wait their opportunity. You got to trust these guys. They know how to play the game as well. Tuffy already has a base hit, an RBI, scored a run. Cliff Pennington with two hits, a couple RBIs. He scored a run. Killer bees. Well, with the theme of our Valley Honda dealers, the killer bees have been very helpful. You've got Pennington who's two for two with two RBIs. Tuffy's one for one so far with an RBI. Cody Ross has been on base twice, a pair of walks. A ball and two strikes. Now, Bob, how does this change things for the Diamondbacks? Obviously, you're going to take the seven runs in the second inning, but you're all geared up for Kershaw. You've got all your lefties on the bench. Suddenly it's the second and now the third inning, and you're facing a right-hander, Jamie Wright. How does that change things for Kirk Gibson? Well, I think now with the five-run lead, you, you just continue to roll with the guys that you started the ball game with. Uh, you have some weapons available off the bench tonight. Not sure of Aaron Hill's availability after the late scratch with the shoulder injury. You've got Gerardo Parra available off the bench. Miguel Montero, Eric Chavez. The killer bees. Tuffy goes a wish. Two for two. First two have reached with base hits for the D backs in the third. Tuffy's hitting to all fields. Oh, hit to the weakness in the defense. You see Adrian Gonzalez holding on Cliff Pennington over there at first, leaving that big hole on the right side of the infield. Take a shot that direction. Sometimes you get rewarded. Well, Chase Anderson had a nice sacrifice bunt his first time up, and he's. In position to do so again with two on and nobody out. It's not a situation, in other words, where suddenly you're going to rush to get the lefties in there. Uh, I wouldn't think so. I mean, some managers choose to do that, but I think with a big lead in the ball game, you just continue to roll with your starting lineup and keep in mind that, as I mentioned, you do have weapons available off the bench if necessary later on. Wheel play is on, but Anderson fouls that one back 0 and 1. Yeah, this is a tough play for the base runner at second. Uh, if Chase Anderson would happen to bunt through the ball. Most of the time, there's going to be a defender at second base. Cliff Pennington needs to get as much of a jump out there as he can to advance on to third base should Chase Anderson get the ball down on the ground. But in that effort to get the big maximum secondary lead, if Chase would happen to bunt through the ball, A.J. Ellis is probably going to come out of the shoot trying to pick him at second base. To the mound. They get the force on Pennington at third, and that's it. Well, that was time for our Lowe's Never Stop Improving Player of the Game, and it is AJ Pollock so far, one for two, an RBI triple score to run. But look at these numbers for AJ Pollock the last 18 games. 352 average, getting on base over 400. Nine extra base hits. He's also stolen five bases over those last 18 ball games. Just doing it all. Playing stellar defense out there in center as well. So after the failed sacrifice attempt, Anderson will run the bases. Two on, one out for Pollock. AJ's triple in the second was his third triple this year. If he goes a wish. 
And Chase Anderson on the bases. One out, a 1 1 count. Hanley steps on the bag. They turn two. We are through three at Chase Field, and Chase Anderson has a 7 2 lead. The Arizona Diamondbacks would like to thank all. Welcome back to Chase Field, where the Diamondbacks lead the Dodgers by a count of 7-2 to two as we head to the top of the fourth inning. I'm happy to be joined by Benson Henderson, part of the UFC Fight Package on Fox Sports. Three weeks from tonight, Benson, thanks so much for joining us. Your match will be against a guy who's a big Russian, and he is formidable. And his name is Rustam Kabbalah. Right? Okay, he's Russian, he's 27 years old, and he's ready to take you down. How are you going to beat him? He's going to do his best shot. He's going to do his best shot. I'm going to do my best shot. I'm making sure I leave that octagon with my hand raised. This will be your second fight as a married man. How does your wife handle the nerves of watching her husband go out into this violent sport? Uh, well, she's pretty good. She, she's uh, kind of used to it. And she's a, a high-level Brazilian jiu-jitsu practitioner herself, so she's used to the uh, ups and downs, the the gut, you know, twisting, watching uh, someone else compete, uh, you know, a loved one, and all that stuff. So she's pretty good with it, actually. All right, you are a Glendale native, and you got your start in this game basically as a wrestler, and you took the opportunity based on a dare to get involved with UFC. How did that all come about? I was just a bunch of guys sitting around. It was, uh, I just graduated college. I was coaching. They, uh, a bunch of guys sitting around. Uh, got around the circle, came to me, and I'm not the you know, toughest of individuals, and they said, oh, yeah, well, you wouldn't do good in the fight. You're, you're way too nice. I'm like, yeah, forget you guys. I, I would fight. Sure, I would. I'm, uh, I'm a tough guy. Uh, but I ended up winning. I fought that night. Three hours later, I won. I was still pretty young at the time, 22, 23. I figured I'd give it a shot, try it out, see how it goes, and I've uh, been doing it ever since. Well, Benson, now you're 30 years old, and you have a record of 20 up and only three down. What's it going to take to win three weeks from tonight? Uh, three weeks from tonight in Albuquerque, New Mexico, June 7th. It's going to take me putting the pressure on Rustam, keeping him on his heels. When he's on his heels, he's not as good. When he's coming forward, when he's pushing the pace, he does a little bit better. So it's all about keeping him off balance and keeping him on his heels, not knowing what's next. Fans may want to turn in and see what this guy looks like just because I got an Ivan Drago vibe when I was doing some research on him earlier today. For folks who haven't seen you fight, what are they missing? Uh, if you haven't seen me fight, you're definitely missing out. You guys want to check it out. Uh, but it's, it's just a, um, the purest and most uncompromised form of competition there is. And there's no balls, no nets, no hoops, no other people. It's just two people. One man, one man, one woman, one woman, and you find out who's better. Do whatever it is you want to do. 
So it's the purest, most uncompromised form of uh, self-expression I think that you can, you can have. And Benson Henderson will try to be better for a 21st time in his career. Thanks so much for joining us. Fellas, back to you. Well, Carl Crawford versus Chase Anderson is going to die at the track in the corner as Marte is under it for the second out. Thanks very much and good luck, Benson. Tell you what, in terms of one-on-one, -on -one, if somebody had said, well, it's Clayton Kershaw versus Chase Anderson and it'll be 7 nothing after two, you would have thought it would have gone one way, but instead it's gone the other. And Anderson so far has a big advantage in his matchup with the reigning NL Cy Young winner with two outs at work to Juan Uribe here in the fourth. And it's a matchup that Chase Anderson had been looking forward to since he was a kid. That one has popped up. Tough he goes a wish. Chase Anderson works a one, two, three, fourth, and he leads it seven two. Senior Brandy Johnson's perfect game against the Braves. And you can be right here at Chase Field to help the Diamondbacks celebrate the first 20,000 fans in attendance tomorrow. Get a Randy Johnson perfect game anniversary commemorative t-shirt courtesy of Pepsi. And then join the D-backs for a special pregame ceremony as we welcome Randy back to Chase Field. For tickets, visit dbacks.com slash tickets. And it's going to be quite a day here tomorrow. And I... A small role in it for you, I hear. Yeah, yeah, looking forward to that. I haven't seen Randy in quite a while. Uh, of course, I've run into Robbie Hammock many, many times over at Salt River Fields, either an extended spring or big league camp in spring training. It uh, should be a lot of fun. And if you want to get in the spirit of things, Fox Sports Arizona will re air Randy Johnson's perfect game tonight, right after the postgame show. Diamondbacks live here from Chase Field. Chris Owens jumps on the first one, and Chris Owens has hit it. The same guy, he's gonna keep that one. Now we gotta get him two contracts. Chris Owings, his second major league homer in the Diamondbacks, lead at 8 2. Hey, talk about picking the right seat. Yeah. Couldn't place that guy any better with defensive spray charts. Got a sinker down and in. Back spins that ball way out of here to our buddy out there in a the green shirt. Chris Owings, in terms of the cycle, has already got the triple and a home run. It's only the fourth inning. Paul Goldschmidt, an RBI double E scored the run his last time up. Boy, you picked the right seat there, buddy. He threw the Puig ball back immediately. He's keeping the one hit by Owings. You know, they have a promotion here between innings. We don't usually get the chance to show it on TV. The negotiations are underway right now. Where the fan goes on the field and tries to catch a pop-up. 
And you got to, they, they, they put three in there, and Baxter's down there, and you know that that machine that shoots the pop ups way up in the air. And if you catch him, you get you get a prize. Well, they're gonna they're gonna try and get this dude. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Kind of curious to see how he's gonna do. I mean, he's used to fielding line drives hit directly at him. <laughs> These are gonna be way up in the air. Now the roof and the panels are open, so it uh, it's gonna be interesting. I'll tell you what else is going to be interesting is this next pitch from Jamie Wright. This could get Goldie turned around. The 3 1. Ball four. It's good to see him take ball four. He's been chasing a lot of those borderline pitches. I really thought Jamie was going to give him something to hit right there. And yeah, the walk rate for Goldie has been something of an issue. He is uh, walking less than half as often as he did last season. And remember, last year he was third in the National League in bases on balls, fourth and on base percentage, but this year the walk rate has declined. Here's Cody speaking of walks. He's walked twice tonight. Strike one. Good day to be a D-back. Tony the Russes first day on the job. Season high, eight runs for the Diamondbacks. They did that March 31st against the Giants, and there is the D-backs' new chief baseball officer with president and CEO Derek Hall. Anytime your job title has officer in it, baseball players immediately call you the new sheriff. There's a new sheriff in town. Oh, because he's an officer? Yeah, that's yes, right. He, <laughs> And there is President and CEO Derek Hall on the left, Chief Baseball Officer Tony LaRusa on the right. Well, sometimes they might call you Senator. Mm -hmm. And of course, as we know, next to us is the governor. The governor. 1 1 to Cody. Hey fans, it's that time again. Tweet us your fan photo using the hashtag AZFanPhoto for your chance to have it shown. In an upcoming game broadcast, it will be an overlooked, perused, observed by the Brindley Committee. It's brought to you by our friends at AT&T. That's coming up later in the game. And even if we don't pick your photo today, we could very well use it on a later broadcast. That one is in there. Base hit for Ross. Goldie takes the turn and heads for third. Puig holds up on the throw. A homer, a walk, and a single to open the fourth. I thought somebody was going to go out there and tackle him before he could throw it. <laughs> well, just another sign of how Yasiel Puig has matured uh, since last season. Last year, you could almost bet money that he was going to throw this ball up into the upper deck. Didn't have a good grip on it. Wanted to throw to third base badly. But this year, he realizes that's eh, a low percentage play. I'm just going to hang on to this ball, keep the double play in order. And to his credit, he is starting to get it. He has listened. And he is learning. So it's Paul Goldschmidt at third, Cody Ross at first. Martin Prado, who had two singles in that Diamondback seven run second. He got up twice and single twice. Once for a run. and throws makes a terrific play to get the force on Ross but Goldschmidt scores the ninth Diamondback run it's nine to two but D Gordon showing some tremendous athleticism right there yeah, very dangerous play running to your left turning and throwing back almost blindly to the bag at second that one might sneak through into right field for another base hit Fielder's choice in an RBI for Prado, and here is Alfredo Marte. Marte is trying to get in on the hit parade here. He's 0 for 2. Oh. 
Nine runs, 11 hits so far for the Diamondbacks through three and a third. Dodgers got there, two on a Puig homer in the third inning, his ninth of the year. A seven run Arizona second. They've added two more here in the fourth. Bob, until he stops swinging like that, you can just throw him off speed stuff and get him out all day. Four fastballs where he can't get to them. Either elevate him up above the top of the zone, keep him on that outside corner. And as I said in his last at bat, when he gets to two strikes, his swing looks completely different. It's much quicker, more direct to the ball. He waits a little bit longer. Going to hit some Titanic home runs in his career. With that big swing, occasionally he's going to catch up to a fastball. Somebody's going to hang a breaking ball in the middle of the plate, and he's going to connect with that big swing and hit it a mile. In three, two, one. Well, we've seen him do it at Salt River. Last spring and this spring, he's hit some moonshots down there. A good first month at Triple A Reno before his call up. Marte down there was hitting over 340. 11 RBIs in 26 games. Chopped in the hole, you're even. They'll only get one. Marte's aboard. And one of the three Diamondbacks to hit triples in that second inning comes up. It's Cliff Pennington so far. Penny is two for two. A triple and a single he's driven into. Three triples in one inning. First time in Diamondbacks history that's ever happened. And it's funny for Cliff, he hadn't had an at bat since last Sunday against the White Sox when he got the start there, went one for four with a double. So it had been a week since he'd stepped in there, but so far, two for two. One thing that's hurt the Diamondbacks offensively this year, the lack of timely hits. Those ones with runners in scoring position. Not the case tonight. Six for 11 with runners in scoring position for the Diamondbacks. Marte takes off. The throw from Ellis is not in time. Stolen base for Alfredo Marte. Wood is on the gas pedal.
a season high nine runs and lead the Dodgers by a count of nine to two. And I am sitting alongside one of the luckiest people on the planet, Cameron Wright of Scottsdale. Not only did he catch Puig's home run ball, you also were on the receiving end of Chris Owings' second home run of the season. You got some kind of magic work in here, Cameron? Well, it's my mom's uh, 50th birthday so for us to be here today, so it's, uh, you know, it's a special day for us. So you ended up throwing the Puig ball back. But what did you do with the Owings ball? I gave it to my mom, and they're going to have him sign it. We're hoping he'll say happy 50th birthday on it, but we'll uh, see how that goes. I know some people. I'm going to try to make some magic happen for you. Seriously, has this kind of experience ever happened to you before at a Diamondbacks game? I've caught a foul ball, but never a home run. So that's a new, new thing for me. Okay. And any thought to thinking of keeping that Puig ball for a second? So as soon as we sat down here, um, I realized there was a good opportunity to get a home run ball. And I told myself, if I get a ball, especially from Neil Steele Puig, I'm throwing it back the second I get it. And <laughs> as soon as I saw it in the air, I'm like, this is my chance. And I just, I'm lucky I didn't hit anybody on the bat when I was winding up to throw it. But, yeah, I was prepared for it. That's what we like to hear. We just got a big chuckle from the booth. He is Cameron Wright, Mr. Home Run Ball Catcher here at Chase Field. Fellas, back to you. Great job, Cameron. Well, happy birthday to your mother. How about that's quite a day at the yeah. ballpark. 50th birthday. We're just getting started. It's only the fifth inning. <laughs> Brandon League is warming up. There's mother. There's the birthday gal right there. Well hit to right center. AJ Pollock back it up. And it's off the glove. AJ Ellis will stop at second. Well, we saw Pollock track one down in that very spot earlier in the game. Couldn't quite get to that one. Yeah, that's one where you, you get close to the spot and you just throw your glove up in the air and hope it's in the right place, but it hit off the thumb. Fell right down near the 413 mark. A.J. Ellis cruises into second with a double. Just off knee surgery. A.J. Ellis just back at the Dodger lineup this week. And now with a pitcher spot two up. Sean Figgins will hit for right. Brandon League has been warming in the Dodger bullpen. And we'll get a look at Sean Figgins. Just the fourth hit for Los Angeles. Figgins 222 hadn't played a whole lot. Only four for 18. But he's happy to be here after not playing the big leagues last season. He is three for 12 with four bases on balls as a pinch hitter this year. So he's patient in these situations. A ball and a strike. Day certainly for Clayton Kershaw, seven earned runs tied for the third most in his career. Jamie Wright didn't have a whole lot better luck. Two runs on five hits and only two and a third. A walk and a home run allowed. And it looks like we'll look at Brandon League in the Arizona fifth. A ball and two strikes to Figgins heading for the pitcher. Two and two. Mentioned that Chase Anderson had been looking forward to a matchup with Clayton Kershaw for a long time. There's Brandon Lee. Chase from McKinney, Texas. That's about 30 minutes away from where Clayton Kershaw grew up in Highland Park, Texas. And as high school pitchers, they were on course to face each other in the Texas State High School playoffs. 2 2 to Figgins. It's full. But Anderson's team lost a one run game when he pitched in the regional final. Chase had 15 strikeouts, but they lost a close one just as he was set to face Kershaw in the first round of state. So they never did go head to head until today. They were on the same summer ball team later that year, but Kershaw got drafted by the Dodgers, and that was it. He was off to L.A. 
a pretty good summer ball team when you've got Clayton Kershaw and Chase so. Anderson at the top of your rotation. Well, Chase Anderson, he was all state as a senior through three no hitters in high school when he was a senior. On that run where they fell just short of the state championship. Three and two to Sean Figgins. In the air to center. This will back Pollock up again. AJ's under it. Ellis holds. Second base. One out in the D fifth. There's Gordon. D. Gordon. Well, Kershaw went to the Dodgers and Chase Anderson went to the University of Oklahoma. Boomer Sooner pitched there for three years. Diamondbacks took him with a ninth round pick in the 09 draft. He had been drafted uh, twice by the Minnesota Twins. Once in high school and once in junior college. Gordon, Major League stolen base leader, has been on base twice. A single and a walk. Breaking ball in there for a strike on one. That was a good weapon for Chase against the White Sox. Second and third time, or second time through the order. Throwing that curveball up there for strike one. Just kind of rolling it up there toward the middle of the plate. Trusting that the White Sox hitters were looking for a first pitch fastball. So he was able to jump ahead in the count quite often with that curveball. What's the difference? Because we hear this all the time. Pitchers say, I was able to throw my curveball for strikes. Obviously, it's a strike that that helps you. But what's the difference when you're throwing it as kind of a show me pitch and when you're actually throwing it for strikes? Well, a lot of guys, their curveball is their second, third, or fourth best pitch. And they want to show it to hitters, but they don't want to make a mistake. So you'll see a lot of them bounce in the dirt. A lot of them will be wide of the strike zone. Just because they're, they want to show it to the opposition, but they don't necessarily want to throw it for a strike. In Chase Anderson's case, uh, it's a pitch that he can throw for strikes when he's behind in the count or wants to jump ahead with that first pitch curveball. Because when you know the other guy is going to throw it for a strike, as the hitter, you have to respect it a lot more, don't you? Oh, sure. But I've yet to hear of the hitter in all the advanced meetings I've had to sit through over the years. I've never heard somebody say he's a first ball breaking ball hitter. <laughs> he's up there looking. They're for always him. first ball fastball. You see the assortment of pitches. Uh, Chase Anderson's ready tonight. He throws it about 15 percent of the time. Which is about right. You know just just roll it up there especially early in the game. Show it early first time through the order to plant that seed. You don't even have to throw another one the rest of the game as good as his changeup can be. Bounces one there, rolls all the way to the backstop, and Ellis will get third. That's a wild pitch for Chase Anderson, his second of the ball game. Puig homeward his last time up. And yeah, it's nine to two, but you don't want to put two guys on ahead of him if he can help it. Right by Davy Lopes at first, and Barry Zins is there to oh, field it off the nice. carom nicely. Nice. Quick feet. And he's already got a young man picked out in a goldy t shirt to get the souvenir. Doc down there and left, so looking for his chance. 2 2. Oh! That's a foul ball. Ball Schreiber at first. Well, now Barry this time was not well played. <laughs> it's an evaluation period. <laughs> Thumbs up. <laughs> See, Doc on the other side, he can, he can relate. I played that wall before. It's tough. <laughs> <He's>, <laughs> there it is. Chief baseball officer is writing that down. Yeah, okay, Barry Zins, he's out. 
Two and two. A little flare. And Chris Owens is under it. Second out there, and now we'll deal with Puig. Well, we'll say it right now before he even gets in the batter's box. Watch the first pitch. He has struck out and homered. Yeah, bring it on. <laughs> The home run extends his hitting streak to 16 games, during which he is batting about 430. First pitch change up on the way. He lays off 1 and 0. A little smile from Yasiel. Well, he couldn't have seriously thought he was going to get another first pitch fastball right down the middle, could he? <laughs> well, Don Mattingly has said that opposing teams have been pitching Puig like he's going to chase, and he's quit chasing. He's made some adjustments. Chases that one 1 and 1. This was Yasiel Puig in the third. And bushing a first pitch fastball from Chase Anderson. No doubt about that. Up on the terrace, and you're going to have this. <laughs> Puig three for five last night with a homer. And he's homered again today. Gets a piece, one and two. Weeks upset. Tuffy Gosowitz and Chase Anderson are ecstatic. That pitch was supposed to be inside on the corner or farther inside and straight out over the plate and down. Fortunately, Puig just fouled it back. Change up. One and two, you throw that well off the corner there. And last year, Puig might have taken a wild swing at that one, but this year he lays off and gets back even. I don't think last year he would have gotten to a two. <laughs> That's out. true, he wouldn't have gotten this far. <laughs> Strikes out Quig for the second time tonight. Dodgers are 0 for 6 with runners in scoring position. Central League, you're linked to what's next. Tuffy, 2 for 2. He'll lead it off.
Kachenko by signing up at one of the 16 interactive kiosks right here at Chase Field during any Arizona Diamondbacks regular season home game. This has been quite a regular season home game. D-backs beating up on the Dodgers. It's 9-2, and now the third Dodger pitcher of the ball game is in. It's the guy who for a long time was the villain in that bullpen. He had a, a tough Dodger career, but as of late, he's been their best relief pitcher. It's Brandon League who has not given up an earned run in 11 straight appearances. He's suddenly become their best reliever. Boy, he was on the ropes for quite a while there. You wondered how much longer he was going to be with the Dodgers, but has uh, righted the ship, so to speak. Heavy sinker, split finger fastball, occasional slider from Brandon Lee. Say hi. 9-2 D-backs as we start the fifth. We started off with everything closed, but on this beautiful night in downtown Phoenix, the roof and panels are now open. As Tuffy goes a wish, leads off the Arizona fifth. So far, Tuffy two for two. A pair of singles. He's got an RBI. He hasn't played since May 4th against the Padres. In this game, he's getting his first at bats in two weeks. Chops one to third. Uribe throws him out, one away. For me, the hardest thing when you're not playing regularly like Tuffy and like Cliff Pennington, some of the guys that don't get regular at bats, the toughest thing is not being overly aggressive. I mean, you only get to play once every two or three weeks. You want to go out there and make something happen. And occasionally you'll chase some bad pitches. You'll expand your own strike zone just because you want so badly to be a part of it and do something to help the team win. Now that sounds like the voice of experience. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Tuffy getting just his fifth start behind the plate this year. You remember a stretch where you were healthy, but for whatever reason, the guy ahead of you was just hot or on a hitting streak, and it had suddenly you look up and you haven't played in a week and a half, two weeks? I don't know if I ever went a stretch yeah. that long. I was fortunate when I got called to the major leagues to be part of a platoon, so at least I knew against lefties I was going to get my chances to play. And once those lefties came out of the game, unless we had a big lead, usually I came out of the game too. But uh, yeah, there were there were some times when uh, Bob Melvin stole my playing time. But uh, we managed to ham and egg that pretty good. Thomas to first, Gonzalez had taken himself. Two up, two down against the league in the fifth. I mean, things that uh, later I came to look for in a man as a manager. You know, you look for certain matchups. You look for certain matchups with your own pitching staff. There were guys on the Giants staff that Bob Melvin had a better relationship and worked better with. And there were other guys that I worked better with. So Roger Quaid was very careful to make sure to match up the right catchers with the right pitchers. And occasionally, uh, you know, you'd end up sitting for a little while. But uh, it was a good situation back then. But when you do get in there, if it's been a while, you're you're chomping at the oh, bit, right? Yeah, yeah. You want to get five hits every at bat. <laughs> Try to hit uh, every strike out of the ballpark. Take a walk, forget it. I'm not going to see four pitches. High diving Gordon into center. AJ Pollock two for four. Twelve hits for the D-backs. That's why those guys who are able to come off the bench after not playing for a week or ten days or two weeks put together some good at bats, put some good defense, whatever the position may happen to be. That's why those guys are valuable. That's why you see some bench players hang around the major leagues for ten years sometimes as a part-time player because they're able to handle that workload, uh, that sporadic workload, and still be an effective player. And that is Tuffy goes a wish, the backup catcher. Talking to Mike Harkey, the pitching coach. Now here's Chris Owings batting in the fifth, already halfway to the cycle, and he's got all the hard stuff out of the way. He tripled and scored in the second. And then homered his last time up. So he's a single and a double away. So if you're going to get a cycle, so far CO is a pretty decent shot at it and we've seen him get his share of hustle doubles balls that would normally be considered a routine single and he just refuses to stop puts the pressure on the defense and has legs some of them into doubles this year and or if you want to just jog around the bases you can do this yeah this is a little bit easier a little bit quicker trip around the bases same spot that Puig hit his for so in second big league home run that's good for CL. He had been 0 for 13 coming in. Oh, hop 
for the third. Uribe throws him out. And we're through five. It's 9 2 D backs. Be made personnel wise, he's going to have the final say. So there'll be recommendations from the general manager, from that staff, uh, and Tony will give the, the yay or nay, but he'll also give direction as well once he assesses what our needs are. Um, it, could, it could change what our approach might be at the trade deadline. It could, just, it could change what our philosophy will be in the offseason. That's really going to be Tony's direction. Uh, then you leave it up to the general manager and his staff to go uh, follow those mandates and find those players. Diamondbacks president and CEO Derek Hall, he and owner Ken Kendrick, the only people that Tony LaRusso reports to now in the Diamondbacks organization in terms of the baseball operations. So LaRusso today named Diamondbacks new chief baseball officer, and he will oversee the entire baseball operations department, Bob. So how do you think that changes the dynamic here this year? Well, uh, I think like we said earlier, there's a new sheriff in town. And Lee Ramirez leads off the sixth against Chase Anderson. I mean, it's not like they pulled some accountant off the street and uh, suddenly made him the chief baseball officer. This is a guy that has a proven track record, is highly respected in the game of baseball. He's highly connected in the game of baseball. And um, I would have to think that uh, obviously everything is going to go through Tony La Russa. And you presume, and Tony kind of gave us this idea when he was with us in the second inning that this is the beginning of an evaluation period and everyone is being evaluated which I'm sure for a lot of people a little nervous you've got a guy that's heading into the Hall of Fame who's been handed the keys to the car and he can change what he wants it's up to him well, you know, there's uh, there's nothing in the uniform players contract that says you have the right to be comfortable I mean, uh, this is a very competitive game, and every year there's more and more players entering Major League Baseball or entering professional baseball in the amateur draft. Guys working their way through the minor league system. Uh, you've got to perform at this level. Hanley hits that high in the air to right, but room for Marte. All right. Tony La Russa, 33 seasons as a manager. He started with the White Sox, hired by Roland Heeman in 1979, who was then the GM in Chicago and is now a Diamondback special assistant. Of course, he was in Oakland. He was in St. Louis. Three World Series rings, and he will be inducted into Baseball's Hall of Fame this July. And now he is in charge of all baseball personnel decisions for the Arizona Diamondbacks on and off the field and there's a connection here it's it's coincidental you're here with Mark McGuire in the ballpark as the Dodgers hitting coach and the Diamondbacks after this series go to St. Louis where of course Tony had a pretty good run as their field manager but now in a whole new role for him chief baseball officer and it's something that he had been pursuing now this winter a lot of connections here. You've got Roland Heeman. You've got Mark 
McGuire at the ballpark. You've got Dave McKay already in the organization. Dave Duncan, who was hired this spring. One and one to Adrian Gonzalez. Yeah, and certainly Tony LaRusso's reach will extend beyond just the players on the field. I mean, uh, scouts, minor league coaches and managers. I, I think everybody is going to be reevaluated and see if uh, what they're bringing to the table for the D-backs organization is what uh, they're looking for moving forward. Now, it's funny because he mentioned that here. He mentioned that in his news conference, and we've seen that with other successful organizations, that no matter how small the fundamental play may be, that the instruction at the very lowest levels of your organization is the same as it is in the major league. So the, when you're getting up to the big leagues, you're not learning anything new. It's almost like a refresher course because you've been taught to do one thing the same way at every level through rookie ball, A ball, double A, triple A, all the way on up. And understand what the expectations are. He referred to the St. Louis Cardinals, and certainly they've had to call up a lot of young players uh, in Tony's tenure there. And when those guys get to the big leagues, uh, they know what's expected of them. Adrian Gonzalez lines that into center for a one-out single. And so it's not just, okay, who is going to be the GM, who's going to be the manager, who's going to pitch, who's going to, what's the lineup going to be? It goes much, much deeper than that. Way, way down there, starting at the lowest levels. So that there's one book on the Diamondback way, so to speak. I mean, we see it every year. Uh, it happened here in Arizona in 2004 when you have an influx of young players to the major league level, and suddenly you have to back up a little bit and re instruct these guys. They already know the fundamentals of the game, they know their own duties on a baseball field, but occasionally you have to back up a little bit and remind them what it is they need to do at this level to be successful. Ideally, you get to a situation where when you call players up from double A AA or triple A and they put that big league uniform on for the first time. They know what they're expected to do. Owen one to Matt Kemp. Long time the twins were that kind of organization under Tom Kelly and later Rod Garden hire mm -hmm. they call guys up from the minor leagues guys that they drafted and developed and when those guys came to the big leagues they were immediately thrown into the fire and expected to perform the twins way same thing could be said for the Atlanta Braves for a long long time under Bobby Cox and John Sherholtz they had a Braves way of doing things in the minor leagues so when you got to the big leagues you just hit the ground running. Chris Owings is a great example. First round pick by the D-backs, signed out of high school as a 17-year-old kid. And he's come all the way up through the system. And now, by the time Chris got here this year, he'd already had more than 2,000 professional plate appearances for the Diamondbacks. And he's only 22 years old. So if a guy like Chris Owings, who starts at the bottom as a 17-year-old high school kid, is taught the same way to do things, no matter what it is, whatever fundamental play it is, at every level of his minor league experience, how much better is he going to be when he gets up here? Absolutely. I mean, the familiarity factor, you know, the comfort factor. A kid like Chris Owings, obviously a lot on your plate when you're a rookie playing shortstop at the major league level, but because of that experience and because of the teaching that he had in the organization before he got here, he was very confident and very comfortable in what he could do to help a team win. And some of the young guys, Ender Enciarte, Alfredo Marte. Two balls and two strikes to Matt Kemp. So there's so much that comes now, all of it comes under the supervision of Tony La Russa, but you really do have to think organizationally. It's not just about the 25 guys that are here. It's about every player in the system. And you see that when you're here in spring training at Salt River Fields and you've got guys in the, the backfields and minor leaguers and there's seemingly hundreds of players all over the place. He's responsible now for all of it and the coaches and the managers at every level. Yeah, knowing Tony La Russa the way I do and how important his coaching staff was in his success, he always gives credit to his coaches. Of course, you mentioned Dave Duncan, Dave McKay. Jose Akendo, Joe Patini, Mike Aldretti, all the guys that he kind of took with him everywhere he went. 
He relies heavily on those coaches when he was a manager, and I'm sure he's going to rely on a lot of people in this organization to quickly get up to speed. Another 2 2. Kemp reaches down and knocks that into right. Gonzalez is in at third, and Matt Kemp has himself a double. And now Chase Anderson knocking on the door of 100 pitches here. Bullpen has been quiet, but quickly now things are stirring for the Diamondbacks. The only runs Anderson has allowed all day were on the Puig homer in the third. Evan Marshall, speaking of young players coming up through the Diamondback system, he's throwing in the Sanderson Ford bullpen. Well, not a bad pitch, kind of down over the middle of the plate. Long at bat that time by Matt Kemp. Just stuck his bat out there in a defensive swing and keeps it fair down that right field line. Mike Harkey. Chase Anderson had a 24 pitch fifth in it. And had to work to kind of get out of a little mini jam after the leadoff double by Ellis. And he's had 18 pitches in this inning. So the Dodgers yeah, starting to foul way walk way more way pitches way. as we saw in the Kemp at bat. And drive that pitch count up now with Gonzalez, the runner at third, and Kemp at second. One out, and Anderson will work to Carl Crawford. Crawford 0 for 2 so far. Crawford is third. And it's a 9-5 ball game. Second home run tonight. Give it up by Chase Anderson. Well, Chase has been tiring a bit. He's been working a lot more over the last two innings, and it's catching up with him. Yeah, just tried to roll that curveball we were talking about an inning ago. Jump ahead in the count with that curveball for a strike. And that time Carl Crawford was hiding in the weeds waiting for it. And now Kirk Gibson is out to get his young right-hander. That's it for Chase Anderson. His second big league start. Still in line for the win. Pitching change back after this. in part by Lone Butte Casino. You're in for more winning moments at Lone Butte Casino. And by Cox Communications. Bundle and save with Cox. Chase Field, Chase Anderson. 95 pitches. Uh, well, just two mistakes, I guess. The homer by Puig, a two-run shot in the third. And then 
The hang and curve, a three run homer by Crawford, and those have accounted for all five LA runs. At the plate, third baseman. And now the new pitcher on for the Diamondbacks, pitching for the first time since uh, Monday's ball game against the Nationals. It's Evan Marshall. Entered this season ranked by Baseball America as the number 19 prospect in the D backs organization. Only the third Diamondbacks reliever to get a win in his major league debut. He'll work to Juan Uribe with the one out in the sixth. Three runs in on the Crawford homer. First pitch swing and it's in the right, a base hit. Four straight hits for the Dodgers. And Uribe is two for three, a pair of singles. Brings up A.J. Ellis. He hit into a double play in the second and doubled his last time. Ellis missed 34 games after surgery on his left knee to repair a torn meniscus. Andre Ethier is in the on-deck circle. Pitcher spot is up next. There's the strike, and last night was just Ellis's the second start behind the plate for the Dodgers since the knee surgery. He was on base three times, an RBI single and two walks. Out of play. Chris Witherow warming up the right-hander. Hey, one thing when Tony La Russa does get in there and really look at what the Diamondbacks have in their system, he's going to see a lot of very good young arms in some bullpens. Places like Visalian, Mobile, and Reno, South Bend. And Evan Marshall might just be the first to get up here. There's several more behind him. If you look at guys like Matt Stites and Jake Barrett and Jimmy Scherfe, We've got some promising relievers in this system. And something to think about for later in this year and then down the road. This is at 95, a ball and two strikes. Well, that's a tough pitch to take right there. Nasty sinker just off the outside corner, trying to work its way back, but just a little bit outside. Marshall can bring it at 95. His ball moves a lot, a lot of life on it, a lot of jump. Fourth round pick out of Kansas State in the 2011 draft. Ellis drives that to Marte and right, still backing up. He got himself all turned around. He bounces out of his glove. Uribe had to hold up. He's in a third. A little spinorama for Marte and Wright. And now the Dodgers. It's 9-5. They have second and third and one out. Well, we see the ball carry extremely well to right center and right field. Marte got completely turned around, still got a glove on. Looked like he took his eye off that ball at the very last instant. It rattled around that big outfielder's glove and came out. That'll be ruled an error on Alfredo Marte. And Uribe, who presumed the ball was going to be caught, had to hold up halfway to second. So he stops at third. Ellis at second now. And Ethier will hit for the pitcher. And the Dodgers suddenly. Down four, have the tying run on deck. First pitch into left. Base hit in front of Cody. Uribe scores. Here comes Ellis. He will score. And it's a two run ball game. hits plus the error in this inning. Q shot right off the end of Andre Ethier's bat able to keep it fair down into that left field corner. Thunder in this Dodgers lineup. You got to finish what you start. Top of the order D Gordon. 
And Gordon suddenly is the tying run at the plate. And unfortunately, this uh, rebound here in the sixth inning has woken up the Dodger fans here at Chase Field tonight. One hit, foul. Hang in there, D-backs fans. Dodgers, who were 0 for 6 with runners in scoring position, are now 2 for the last two a three run homer and a two run double. Paul Goldsmith at first, Martin Prado at third, both in on the corners. Joe Thatcher, the left hander, warms up in the Sanderson Ford bullpen. He would presumably get Gonzalez if the inning continues. 0 oh 2. D backs got seven in the second as they knocked Kershaw out of the ball game. Dodgers added two in the third on the Puig homer. D backs got two more in the fourth to lead it 9 2, but suddenly it's a five run LA sixth. And still only one out. Off the fist, left center, could be trouble. Cody wants it. Two down. Cody Ross took command out there on a play. There might have been some confusion. And you see the veteran in the outfield for the Diamondbacks. Here's Puy. He has homered and struck out twice. Ninth man to hit in this inning for the Dodgers. Chopped over the mound. Top play for Owings. Get him! Hold on. Craig is signaling to the Dodger dugout that he beat it out. Don Mattingly on the top step. And he's coming out to have a discussion with Paul Schreiber. Mattingly signaling for his base runner, Ethier, to stay put. Donnie, baseball going with a high socks. Different look for him. Let's take a look at this play. And he's just going to wait for the word thumbs up, thumbs down from his clubhouse. Now remember, it's important on this play to note the definition of a catch as determined by the rules committee is when the ball is in the back of the glove. That's when the catch is made. Right there, the ball is in the back of the glove, the foot not yet on the bat. And Goldie kept his right foot on the base as he was stretching out there to make that play. It certainly appears that the Dodgers are going to lose this challenge. And this is under the category of something we see a lot in the NFL. When is the catch a catch? Does he have possession? Is the ball moving? Well, when is a catch a catch in baseball? In baseball, it's when the ball is in the back of the mitt. And I think that is really going to be important right here. When is the ball in the back of the mitt? There. There. He's out. He's out. There has to be clear and convincing evidence that Puig was safe for the call on the field to be overturned. This is one that makes you scratch your head a little bit. I mean, we've seen several replays. They've shown it four times already on the big board here at Chase Field. There, Diamondbacks. He is out. Mattingly loses his challenge, and the inning ends. 
foul on the field is confirmed, but it's a ball game again here at Chase. Now with a two-run lead over the Dodgers, it's 9-7, and fans at that time again, as promised earlier in the ball game, we have our AT&T fan photo of the game. Tweet it in using the hashtag AZFanPhoto. There is Zane. Zane, a member of our fine military. Hey, we salute you. Fan photo. Wait a minute for your chance to have your picture shown in an upcoming game broadcast. Just use the hashtag AZ fan photo brought to you by AT&T. Dodgers fourth pitcher of the night is on. It's Chris Witherow for the 19th time and still an ERA under one. This guy has been outstanding. He's been really good. If there is a knock against Witherow, he will occasionally get wild, lose that strike zone. You can see 16 walks in 19 innings of work to go along with the 25 punch outs. All Goldschmidt will open the sixth. Goldie Ross Prado, three, four, and five. Goldie has struck out, doubled, and walked. He scored twice. First pitch swinging. Quig. It's behind him. Goldschmidt turns and goes to second. Goldie aboard for the third time tonight. He knocked it down. He's able to slow the roll of the ball. Otherwise, Goldie might have gone all the way around the bases. Well, we talked about Paul Goldschmidt and uh, how unaccustomed we are to seeing Paul Goldschmidt struggle. If you call this struggling, he's five for his last 29. All five hits are doubles. He's got two doubles tonight, now 18 on the year. And here's Cody Ross, who has been on base all three times. He's been up two walks and a single. He scored a run. Well, Cody just four base hits in all of April coming off the hip injury, but he's already more than double that total here in May. And he says he feels like he's getting close with that swing, seeing the ball a lot better. And letting the ball travel to him as opposed to getting up there and trying to go get it, which is something, Bob, you talked about with the bench guys when they get up there. And Cody very much in that same spot coming off the major hip injury. I mean, we've all heard the cliches, you know, trust your hands, stay back, let the ball come to you, let it travel. It will get there. The pitcher lets the ball go. Eventually, it's going to get near the strike zone. There's no reason for you to go out after the baseball. It's going to come to you. Sit back there, good balance, see the ball well, let it travel, and then be quick with your hands. 0 and 2. That is drifting behind the Dodger dugout and out of play. Well, Cody says when he get up there for batting practice, 
Of course, it's BP, so he's relaxed. He's feeling good, starting to feel a little better. No problem, but he said the issue would come up when he'd get in the game in situations like this, and he'd just go out there and try and get it, which he said is sort of a recipe for disaster. Should be a fastball up here, I'm guessing. Watching the actions of A.J. Ellis behind the plate. And he lays off at 95, 1 and 2. Yeah, I've said this before, but a fastball is the only pitch a catcher will ask for up in the zone. You don't ask for high curveballs or high sliders or high changeups, but you do request high fastballs. Yeah, throw some high curves and high changeups <laughs> and see how long that works up for you. <laughs> Got him. They retire Ross for the first time tonight. One away. Martin Prado, two base hits tonight. Both of them coming in the second inning. And the Diamondbacks got seven runs on seven hits and knocked Kershaw out of the ball game. They let it 9 2. Dodgers have answered with a five run six to make it a two run game. And goalies at second after a leadoff double. Strike one. Witherow is a former first round pick, selected 20th overall in the 07 draft. Out of high school in Midland, Texas. That is going to get down in left center. Goldschmidt will score. Prado heads for second. Martin Prado, RBI number 14, his seventh double, and it's 10 7. Goldie scored three times today. Seventh extra base hit in the ball game. Boy, the Dodger outfielders are leaving some big splits in the gaps out there. Anything that's hit toward left center, right center turns into extra bases quickly. And here on his bobblehead day is Gerardo Parra. He'll hit for Marte. So a defensive change as well for the Diamondbacks as Parra will take over and right for Marte. who got himself all turned around on that ball hit by Ellis in the top half of the inning. Gerardo Parra bobblehead day here at Chase Field. Parra won for four last night in the series opener. He has hit safely in 12 of his last 13. He's at 271 on the year. This is playable. Gonzalez, Uribe. Uribe almost tripped over the mound, but Gonzalez has it. And that's the second out. It would have been something if he fell right into Adrian on that one, but it's two down. Here is the Gerardo Parra bobblehead here at Chase Field. Look at that behind her. What a night he was. Beautiful. Great crowd, more than 36,000. Go D backs. Have to yeah. find a way to get Gerardo Parr to the plate one more time in this ball game on his bobblehead night. Six Diamondbacks have homered on their bobblehead day. Chris Young, Mark Reynolds, Justin Upton, Connor Jackson, Junior Spivey, and Steve Finley all homering on their bobblehead days. Well, the way the night's going, I wouldn't rule anything out. Pennington skies one to right. 
Krieg in the corner. Near the and he almost robs what would have been a foul ball. And is a foul ball. He made a heck of a play on it. And he almost caught that for the outs. Cleaned out the bullpen out there. Knocked over a trunk. Going to need some more Gatorade down there. Got to hydrate. Oh, we got a glove on it. Amazed he didn't injure his wrist. Some fans probably saw the effort that uh, Puig gave in a game down in Miami last week. Oh, crashing into the wall trying else. to make a catch. Violent collision with the outfield wall in Marlins Park. So it's 0-1 to Pennington. Cliff has a triple and a single. He's driven in two. All that and it goes down to strike one. Mm -hmm. Fourteen hits for the D backs, nine for the Dodgers. A ball and two strikes. Called strike three. Second strikeout in the inning for Witherow. Strands the runner, but the D-backs get one more. Head to the seventh. It's 10-7 Arizona. Uh, gives gives us a head start because in fact I talked to uh, Dunk this morning I talked to Dave this morning because we, we all agree to be confidential so uh, this morning I, I talked to both of them and already started getting input but I'm lucky we're lucky they're here and if I wasn't here they were still lucky because those two guys are great well, that is the Diamondbacks' new chief baseball officer, Tony La Russa, talking about his longtime friends and colleagues, Dave Duncan and Dave McKay, our first base coach. I spoke with Coach McKay just before the ball game, and I asked him if he had any inkling that La Russa was in position to take this kind of role with the Diamondbacks, and he said he had no clue, again, back to the stealthness of both Ken Kendrick and Derek Hall in all of this. In fact, McKay owns property near La Russa in the Valley, and even with that close proximity, it was still a surprise to him today. Fellas, back to you. Top secret. Gerardo Parra on his bobblehead day remains in the game and takes over for Alfredo Marte in right field as Hanley Ramirez leads off the seventh. 
10 runs, 14 hits for the D backs, 7 runs, 9 hits for the Dodgers. Hanley so far 0 for 3. And there is a certain synergy here with the announcement on Tony LaRussa coming today. Not only were the Diamondbacks about to head to St. Louis, purely coincidental, not ironic, but you've also got Dave McKay here and Dave Duncan, the Daves as he was talking about. Mark McGuire here in his role as Dodger hitting coach. All the stars were aligned for the big announcement earlier today, Chase Field. Of course, Mark McGuire, remember those Bash Brothers Oakland A's teams under Tony La Russa, and then later came to the Cardinals. Back down to Cindy. Just to follow up, guys, real quick on the Dave McKay comments and conversations that I had earlier today, it's very important to point out how much Tony La Russa wanted to be here because he said while it was a luxury that both his Daves are here, that if they hadn't been here, he would have taken the job anyway. Good to hear Diamondbacks organization and Tony said he checked everybody out, called all over baseball, telling me about the D-backs and heard nothing. But rave reviews for the Diamondbacks as an organization. Here comes Kirk Gibson. He's had the left-hander Joe Thatcher warming in the bullpen. And with Adrian Gonzalez coming up, Gibby will go to his left-hander. Joe Thatcher coming in. Beat L.A. for her birthday. Well, we're doing what we can for you back after this. and Fry's Food Stores is ready to take you to a D-backs game. Stop by this month's participating Fry's Food Store in Cottonwood or the Cox Solution Store in Mesa. And you can enter to win two seats on the Fan Express bus. Look at that bus. Get on the bus, Gus. You'll get round-trip transport to the D-backs game either June 8th or June 22nd. All the info you need is at FoxSportsArizona.com. A matchup of left-handers here with no outs and one on in the seventh. Joe Thatcher. The third Diamondback pitcher is on to face left hand hitting Adrian Gonzalez 18th appearance of the year for Thatcher and for Gonzalez there's a hundred point drop off in batting average this year when he's in there against left hand pitching. But he's had pretty good luck with Joe Thatcher. Ramirez at first after the leadoff single. Strike one. That's been kind of an odd matchup between these two. Adrian Gonzalez had three consecutive hits against Joe Thatcher at one point, then turned around and struck out four at bats in a row. What do you make of that? I, I don't know. <laughs> Close your eyes. You saw the platoon spits, uh, splits right there, 290 and 192. And there for a strike, quickly 0 and 2. Get ahead.
Gonzalez has been on base twice today. He walked in the first, singled and scored in the sixth. He was hitless last night. Anderson Ford bullpen Brad Ziegler. This is where it gets tricky because you've got nobody out in the inning. And you've got a right hander on deck in Matt Kemp but the lefty right behind in Carl Crawford and ideally you don't have Thatcher face too many right hand hitters. I think this may be the only left handed hitter he faces right here. I have to believe that Brad Ziegler is uh, ready. In the event Joe Thatcher gets his man, we go righty on righty against Kemp. Look for that ground ball double play. One and two. Left center field, Pollock. It drops in front of Cody Ross. Ramirez took a big turn at second, but he's back safely. Gonzalez on for the third time tonight. And the Dodgers will bring the tying run to the plate with nobody out. Center fielder Matt Kemp. That was drifting out toward left center and just kept slicing away from Pollock and dropped in. So a no man's land single and here's Kemp. Hanley Ramirez, the runner at second. Adrian Gonzalez at first. And it looks like Thatcher will work to Kemp. Kemp doubled and scored his last time up. He's one for three. Gibson rolling a dice a little bit right here. Joe Thatcher's given up a batting average of 381, including a home run to right handed hitters this year. You've got your double play machine ready down there in that bullpen in left field. It's especially dangerous considering Kemp is one swing away from tying the ball game. But that has been Gibby's M.O. We've seen him do that with Thatcher so often this year. When you've got a righty in between two lefties, he'll let Thatcher work to all three hitters. But Kemp has really had a hot bat lately. He was 0 for 5 last night, but he's hitting nearly 380 over the last two weeks. Two on, nobody out. Lorenzo Bundy flashing signs at third. Two and one. Three balls and a strike.
talking a little bit earlier about Cody Ross jumping at the ball when he first came back off the DL. A perfect example right there. Matt Kemp had the count in his favor, was looking for a fastball. Jumped out there and hooked that ball foul down the third baseline. Takes the top hand off the bat, trying to extend his swing way out in front of that pitch. up there. Two on, no outs. Another 3-2 pitch to Matt Kemp. In the air to center. A.J. Pollock right in front of the track. Ramirez at second will head for third. And that's the first down. got the lefty lefty matchup that they're going for here by allowing Thatcher to work the camp to get to Thatcher versus Crawford who homered his last time. A deep three run homer to right off Chase Anderson. Well after burning Sean Figgins in the fifth Andre Ethier in the sixth no left handed bats available for Don Mattingly off the bench at this point everybody he has available now swings from the right side. Crawford having a big month hitting over 400 in May. It seems like a little thing but a smart play by A.J. Pollock on that long lazy fly ball to center field. A lot of guys would camp underneath the ball try to throw out the lead runner at third base and in the meantime Adrian Gonzalez would have walked to second base. Instead A.J. came up firing right to second base to hold the runner at first keep the double play in order. One and two. Got him. That's the matchup that Kurt Gibson wanted, and it worked out nicely. Two down. And now with a right-hander, Uribe coming up, we should see Ziegler. Here comes Gibby. So Thatcher gives up the single to Gonzalez, but he gets Kemp to fly out. He punches out Crawford. And now with first and third and two outs, it'll be Ziegler and Uribe when we come back.
one live streaming sports service is celebrating 12 years. And you can join the millions of subscribers, watch every out-of-market game live in True HD on over 400 devices. Just visit dbacks.com for details. Great night to be at the ballpark with us on Gerardo Parra bobblehead night. Chase Anderson, second big league start. And Tony LaRusso's really first game on the job as the D-backs new chief baseball officer. We've seen a little bit of everything so far. And right now, with two Dodgers on and two outs, it's Brad Ziegler to work to Juan Uribe, who is the tying run at the plate here in the seventh. Hanley Ramirez at third, Adrian Gonzalez at first. Strike one. Juan Uribe 0 for 5 lifetime against Brad Ziegler, including a strikeout. It's a nice sheet set 0 for 5. About to be. <laughs> Uribe 2 for 3 tonight, a pair of singles. He scored a run. Just missed there, a ball and a strike. Last night, Uribe was starting a game for the first time in eight days. He Missed five games with a mild hamstring strain. 0 for 4 last night, a couple of strikeouts. And we've seen Brad as he's worked a lot lately, not quite as sharp and crisp as the guy that we've seen throughout this season who's been nearly unhittable. A little surprising to see that last pitch. Uh, Brad Ziegler shook to a changeup. He rarely throws that changeup to right handed hitters, especially in a situation like this. Swing and a miss on a hitter's count. He's even two and two. Great location. Got him. Thatcher strikes out Crawford. Ziegler strikes out Uribe, and they strand two. And now we'll see what kind of magic Joe Borowski can work. D backs lead it 10 7. Come out tomorrow to Chase Field. It's the Fox Sports Arizona Sanderson Ford Kid Caster auditions from 11:30 to 1:30. Those are held here at Chase Field at the Sandlot during the Diamondbacks and the Dodgers game. And young Joe Borowski is with us in the booth right now. <laughs> the evaluation period is underway. Your reaction to the Tony Larusa news? Anytime you can bring somebody in with his track record, his knowledge of the game, I think it's invaluable what he can bring in his, in his leadership and in, in, in just his overall baseball knowledge. I think, especially for a player, it's not necessarily that now you're you're under the microscope, but what he can offer as far as advice, as opinions, you take it to heart because you respect what he's done in this game. 
But there has to be a little bit from a player perspective. Whoa, Tony La Russa? Uh, maybe, maybe a little bit, but you got to remember, you're out on a field trying to do something. You know you're always under the gun. You're always under evaluation. You have to go out there and perform because there's always somebody right behind you looking to take your job. So you have to go out there no matter what, no matter who's around, and you have to go out there and perform. I think now... Maybe they feel a little bit of the pressure, but th that's that's the situation all the time. Now here's a potential dream situation for you, Joe. As Tuffy goes, a wish leads off the inning. Look out in the on deck circle. Uh, did you get the chance to oh. do a little bit of this? I got a, I got a few abs during my career, <laughs> and uh, I'm not going to lie to you. I would prefer to not do that stuff, but uh, you know, the pitcher happened to find my bat a few times. Ziegler on deck, 0-2 on Tuffy. It was two for three, a pair of singles. That one is rolled a second. D. Gordon. And we'll see Brad Ziegler take some hacks. Now, what about this, Bob? You got, I mean, it's still a three run game. You got your guy, you love him. Tough call. Yeah, Brad, you want to get him through Ziegler. the eighth inning? I mean, uh, you've already burned uh, Evan Marshall in this ball game, who would seemingly be the next candidate to be an eighth inning guy. I, I, the thing that's interesting about this, Joe, and you could speak to it better than I can, relief pitchers don't even take batting practice. The starters get to hit. Starters get to hit on a regular basis. Uh, I recall relief pitchers once in a blue moon, you got to go out there and, and you get, you know, seven, eight hacks, but not much more than that. You, Joe, were two for nine in your career with Whoa. seven strikeouts. Mm. And not that I, you know, know my stats at all or anything like that, but I am a career 1,000 hitter as a pinch hitter. Ooh. Do you pinch hit for somebody? Yes. somebody How'd that happen? Somebody made a mistake with a double switch, and I had to lead <laughs> off an inning. I had to run in from the bullpen Oops. in Colorado and pinch hit and then go out and pitch that bottom half of that inning. A for effort. Just running in from the bullpen. I was winded. Oh, yeah, there's no air there. <laughs> I was winded. The old double switch. You forget how much of this job is clerical. AJ Pollock. He has tripled and singled. Scored a run, driven in, and he's a two for four. What'd you see from Chase Anderson other than a couple of home runs? I balls really like him. I'm really impressed with just just he's cool out on the mound. I, I love the fact that he could throw his pitches for strikes. His changeup, I love his changeup. His arm action on that thing really makes it filthy. For me, it was just maybe a little bit of an inexperience. Throws the first pitch fastball to Puig right down the middle instead of understanding what happened in yesterday's game and maybe trying to work as a 1-2-0-2 one, two, oh, two count early in the count to him. And then the one pitch to Crawford, I understand you're trying to throw him a breaking ball early, but understand that Crawford's power is down and in. You don't want to miss down and in with your curveball. If you do miss, miss away. Try to go back door with that, with that curveball. But that's all going to come with experience. He has to face these guys. He has to see them enough, and he has to understand that, all right, I know my game now. I know how to attack him. But I was impressed. I really like his pitches. Fastball, curveball, changeup, and he's not afraid to pitch inside. So I, I was impressed by him. Unfortunately, he made two glaring mistakes, and he didn't get a chance to get him back because he left the yard. He did begin to tire after getting Ramirez yeah. to lead off the six. There was the Gonzalez single, the Kemp at bat, he doubled, and then Crawford jumped on the first pitch for the home run. You could see him kind of hitting the wall there in that inning. Well, and you got to remember also, he didn't throw that many pitches in, when he when he pitched against the White Sox, so his stamina might have been down a little bit. You know, you build up that stamina. You're used to throwing 95 to 100 pitches all the time, and then all of a sudden you back off. And look at the arm speed on that. You would just have him out on his front foot. That's just telling you right there. And, and for me, I love the changeup. I think it's one of the best pitches in baseball because it's almost impossible to pick up velocity when you have the same arm speed on that. And you're not changing anything. You can't pick up spin. You can't pick up a hump coming out of it if you're throwing a curveball. So if you can locate a changeup, it's a devastating pitch. Over the head of Witherow, Hanley charges. He won't get there. Gordon behind him, but Pollock beats it out. That's a base hit for A.J., his third tonight. We talked about it last night, this Dodger defense shaky at best, especially Hanley Ramirez at shortstop. Just fans on this ball probably would have gotten A.J. Pollock if he comes up with it cleanly, but sneaks underneath the glove. D. Gordon behind him trying to make the play, but with Pollock's speed, that's going to take too much time. 
Now if you look at ultimate zone rating which is a defensive metric Ramirez ranks last among those players with at least 200 innings at shortstop this year. A chance for Chris Owings who's got a triple and a homer tonight. Nothing doing. AJ five for six at a stolen base attempts this year. Well, it certainly seems, Joe, like Chase Anderson is part of the long term solution here. It's only been two starts. But based on his track record in the minor leagues and what we've seen yeah. so far in terms of stuff and composure, it looks like he's got a bright future. First two, you know, his, the impression on his first two starts are definitely a positive. It's something to build on. It, it, it's not. It, it doesn't seem like he's overwhelmed by the whole situation no. that he's in out there. He seems very relaxed and calm. And and what impressed me the most was when he gave up that two-run two, two run home run to Puig, he came right back and got the next two guys. You know, he wasn't phased by it. He just went about his business, understood he made a mistake, and corrected them with the next two hitters. Yeah, a couple of fly balls, Ramirez and Gonzalez. Yeah. Some tough outs right there. 2-0 to Owings. There goes Pollock. The throw from Ellis is not in time, and A.J. is running again, his sixth stolen base. More and more upside from A.J. Pollock's game. Well, A.J. gets up to top speed quickly, has fast feet. That crossover step in the first three or four strides, and he's up to full speed. I mean, he's hitting over 350 in May. He's hit safely in nine of his last ten. He's got three hits tonight in a stolen base. Three and zero to Owings. You know, one more thing on uh, Chase Anderson. You know, we saw the curveball to Crawford that got hit yeah. out of the ballpark. The first pitch fastball to Puig. I think with more experience. I mean, you got to keep in mind this guy's been pitching in the yeah. minor leagues. You throw a curveball to a left-handed hitter in the minor leagues, they're going to swing over the top of it. Yes. You throw a first-pitch fastball to a lot of hitters in the minor league, you're going to jump ahead in the count. This is the big leagues, however. He's going to learn to be a little more fine with some of those pitches. Make sure he misses in his favor as that time Whitmore misses up to Chris Owings, putting runners in first and second. But you learn from your experiences. Sure, absolutely. You get banged around a little bit. You give up a couple of long balls. You look at the videotape. Get together with your pitching coach and your catcher, and you make adjustments moving forward. And, and that's the thing, Bob, is, is with his game right now, it's not drastic changes that he has to make. It's more on the experience level, which is good. You're not going in there and having to make drastic things. It's just his knowledge of, of the entire league, and, and that's definitely a huge step above what he, what other people may be going for. Well, you got Godzilla coming out soon. Here's Goldzilla. A two-out single by Pollock. A walk to Owen, so two on for Goldie. Now Rick Honeycutt wants to talk it over. You know, just like we were talking about Adrian Gonzalez earlier in the ball game, even though he's been slumping lately, the damage he's done against the Diamondbacks uh, make you aware of where Adrian Gonzalez is in the lineup. We know that Goldie hasn't been swinging it as well as he normally does, but it's a big situation in the ball game. And Rick Honeycutt has seen Paul Goldschmidt do a lot of damage against the Dodgers. Goldie came in just three for 26, hitless in five of his previous seven games. But tonight he has doubled twice. He has walked and he scored three times. And he does a lot of damage against this division. Going back to the beginning of last season, Goldschmidt and Adrian Gonzalez with the most RBI against their own division. A.J. Pollock is the runner at second. Chris Owings at first. Two outs for Goldie. I'd love to see a gap right now. Watch this race on the bases. Two of the fastest <laughs> guys on the roster on base. Now, Joe, what's the sequence for you here if you're with Rob? Well, the biggest thing is is you want to try and use if you've been watching Goldie and, and how he struggled in the first game here is you want to use over aggressiveness right now. So I'm trying to work away. I don't want to miss into him right here. Mm -hmm. if, if he does get me he's going to he's going to have to beat me away. But I'm going with my best pitch and, and whether he's struggling with fastballs or not. I know later in my career my fastball was not my best pitch. So I wasn't going to attack him 
with my third best pitch. Right. But now you're behind 2-0. Oh. Now you're behind 2-0. Oh. You're going you're gonna to still. This is the one guy in the Diamondbacks lineup. And I'm sure when Rick went out there to talk to him is we cannot let this guy beat us. We'll take our chances if we, if we don't get him with Cody on deck. But this is the one guy we cannot make a mistake to. There's and he, his drive to him. You see him go right there. He's, he, he still throws mid-90 fastball, so he's got something. You just better make sure you don't leave it out over the plate. Now personally, I think in this particular situation, the Dodgers don't care if they walk Paul, don't mm -hmm. you? They'll take their chances with Cody Ross. You're absolutely right, Joe. I think every series you pick a guy you're not going to let beat you, and normally that's Goldie. That's that's got goal. away with one right there. Yeah. Right at it. Ellis hopped back there, and wow, you don't see. Might have fooled Goldie a little bit. Set up outside, then jump back in. Nine career homers against the Dodgers. Two balls and two strikes. He's been reaching for that pitch a lot more lately. And a lot of times when you see somebody who's, who's so successful, you, you wonder if maybe he's he's outthinking himself right now because normally you don't see Goldie let pitches like that go by you don't see him let a fastball down the middle and a good hitters count two and one go by so maybe he's out thinking himself a little bit right here while he's struggling lays off and it's full three and two Pedro's throwing a lot of pitches now up to 36 he came on to start the sixth inning. This is where Goldie has been less patient than he was last year when the count is full. There. Did you see Goldie pull that helmet down, smash that right ear? Yeah, Got to feel good about that. The ear pinch. Now, Joe, they're going to be real sure what this pitch is here. Not only pitch selection, but pitch location. We've seen Goldie chase that fastball low and away recently. You certainly wouldn't expect them to try to challenge him from the middle of the plate in unless it's a horrible mistake. This will be the eighth pitch of the at bat. Pollock at second, Owings at first. Two outs, three and two. Seven games, four hits. He's got three tonight for the Senator. <laughs> well, 
about that throws out our entire discussion yeah. on uh, thinking that pitchers sometimes uh, know what they're doing out there. <laughs> what, what, what he's doing right there, I have that, no idea. That's the only time John McCain will ever be compared <laughs> to Howard Dean. <laughs> Pitchers make mistakes. I'm not sure what Withrow was trying to do right there, but uh, I'm sure Ellis didn't go out there and say, throw me a sinker that comes right back over the plate. <laughs> Let's see how far he can hit one. <laughs> 36,000 plus a chase. And they are loving it. 13 to 7, 2 and 1 to Cody. Cody's already walked twice tonight. One more look. Ellis moves outside right. that ball tails right back over the heart of the plate. Won't even turn around. You know where that one's going to end up. Third walk tonight for Cody Ross. And he's been on base four times. Three minutes tonight with one walk in 69 at bats. He's walked three times in the game, including two against the guy that never walks anybody. And that's going to be it for Witherow. Looks like a double switch on the way from Don Mattingly. As Ender Enciarte will go in and run for Cody. Enciarte now the runner at first. Looks like Justin Turner is coming into the ball game for the Dodgers. And he will replace Uribe. At third, he was filling in at third from time to time while Uribe was out with that hamstring injury. It's 13 7 D backs. Joe Borowski working his magic. Chris Perez coming in. Pitch running for Cody Ross. Homer is eighth of the year, and it's 13 7 Diamondbacks. New pitcher, it is the fifth for the Dodgers tonight. It's former Indians closer Chris Perez on for the 20th time this year, a 4 2 4 ERA. And it is indeed a double switch by Don Mattingly. Justin Turner will take over at third, and he will hit ninth. Pitcher spot is now seventh in the LA order. Enciarte runs at first for Ross. Martin Prado. Prado has two singles and a double. He's driven in three. 13 runs on 16 hits for the Diamondbacks. Seven runs on 11 hits for the Dodgers. And remember, the first two outs of this inning were made on six pitches. Brad Ziegler batted. Tuffy goes a wish, grounded out. Ziegler struck out. Although he battled. <laughs> and then there was a single by Pollock, a walk to Owings, and an absolute moonshot home run by Paul Goldschmidt. Ross walked, and now here's Perez to work to Prado. Well, you love to see the Diamondbacks take advantage of a defensive miscue, even though A.J. Pollock was credited with an infield single. A misplay by Hanley Ramirez could have very easily been the third out of this inning. 
but they took advantage. And again, he ranks, if you look at the defensive metrics, as the worst shortstop in baseball. And he, oh, by the way, would like $130 million next year. Yeah, but I don't want to bend over. You know. <laughs> He'll be a free agent at the end of the year. Three and one. Well, Chris Perez comes in and walks Prado. All this with two outs. So five straight have reached with two outs for the Diamondbacks. And here you go, BB. You wanted another at bat for Ricardo Parra on his bobblehead day. Now, now, why was that exactly? Six Diamondbacks have homered on their bobblehead day. 36,000 plus the first 20,000 here at Chase today got the Gerardo Parra bobblehead as we honor the two time gold glove winner. But well, now it's his bat we're thinking about. Came in a hit for Marte in the sixth. If you weren't with us earlier. The six Diamondbacks to Homer on their bobblehead day. Chris Young, Mark Reynolds, Justin Upton, Connor Jackson, Junior Spivey, and Steve Finley. A little partial to the Junior Spivey and Steve Finley homers. <laughs> I had a feeling you might be. Well, Parra hitting right hand pitching at just over 300 this year. He's got four homers. Three have come against right handers. And he's ahead 2 0. As Perez has come in and not found the strike zone. 95 2 1. What's it like, Joe, when you're a closer and then suddenly you're not a closer? It's tough. It, it you got to remember when when you're a closer, the adrenaline rush that you get when you're closing out games, it, it, it can't be matched. And so it's no, not there. And, and no, in, in any part of the game. But base hit. Enciarte's flying around third. Para heads for second, and he's in there. And the Diamondbacks have doubled up the Dodgers. It's 14-7. Well, we didn't get you your homer, BB, but you'll have to settle for the RBI. We'll take an RBI base hit. Second really went down to get that one. Like a lot of lefties, he likes that ball down and in. And Yasiel Puig throwing on the run, just a little lollipop back into D. Gordon, the cutoff man. And Parr took advantage, moving into scoring position himself. RBI double, Prado at third. All this with two outs. Six straight have reach for the D-backs with two outs as Cliff Pennington takes strike one. A four-run Arizona seventh and two more runs out there. Our APS Energy All-Stars, Diamondback hitters, 14 runs on 17 hits, nine extra base hits, all season highs. A seven-run second, a four-run seventh. And they have batted around as Pennington is the ninth man to hit in the inning. They had 12 bat in that seven-run second. And that's it. Well, Joe, good work out of you. Oh, a lot to talk about there for the game. <laughs> Paul Goldschmidt, his eighth of the year. And this one was a no-doubter. That is not Howard Dean. It's John McCain. Yeah!
Ballpark's all-you-can-eat seats. Combine a great view of the game and all your traditional ballpark foods at prices you can afford. It starts at just 34 bucks. Our club-level all-you-can-eat seats include a menu of hot dogs, popcorn, peanuts, Pepsi, and more. To purchase your tickets, visit dbacks.com slash A-Y-C-E, all you can eat, or call 602-514-8400. Diamondback hitters getting all they can eat tonight. 14 runs on 17 hits, and they lead the Dodgers 14-7. As Ender Inciarte, who pinch ran for Cody Ross, stays in the game. He's in left field, Gerardo Parr in right, and there is Kevin Towers, the GM, meeting with president and CEO Derek Hall on the left and on the right, the D-backs new chief baseball officer, Tony LaRusa. Ellis Turner and Gordon, 8 9 and 1 in the LA 8. Clayton Kershaw versus Chase Anderson seems like a while ago. <laughs> and. Pardon the pun, but Kershaw was chased after one and two-third. Seven runs second by the D-backs. Certainly not what you expect in a Clayton Kershaw pitched ball game. I mean, there are certain games throughout the year. You're facing a kid that's maybe just up from the minor leagues or a reliever that's forced into duty starting a ball game and... You tell yourself as a collective offense, we're going to get fat today. We're going to get some knocks. We're going to score some runs. You don't ever say that facing Clayton Kershaw. Well, Ziegler has come in, and he has struck out Uribe to win the seventh, and Ellis to open the eighth. Yeah, Kershaw worked a nice one, two, three first with two strikeouts. It was a 10-pitch first inning, but it turned into a 40-pitch second inning, the second shortest outing of his career. Most runs allowed in an inning since... The 2010 season against the Brewers. And the most allowed to the D-backs in a single game. His previous high against the Diamondbacks was five runs. Justin Turner was double switched into the game. He's taken over at third base and batting ninth. And the amazing thing was, even though Kershaw was... Coming back off that long injury, he missed uh, almost 50 days with that muscle strain behind his pitching shoulder. In his two previous starts, in each game he had struck out nine and not walked a batter. He was just flat out dominant. And so this one kind of came out of nowhere for Don Mattingly and company. Well, the Diamondbacks offense took advantage of a really good pitcher who was not on his game tonight. He hung some breaking balls. He made some mistakes with fastballs in the middle of the plate. A.J. Pollock won't get that when it rolls to the wall, and Turner has himself a stand-up double. Well, that's what good teams do, I'm always told. You get an opportunity from a guy that's a two-time Cy Young winner, you got to take advantage, and they certainly did that tonight. Yeah, especially early in the ball game, because if you let Kershaw cruise along out there and let him tap dance out of some of those early jams, all of a sudden he finds that, that curveball, and he finds the location on his fastball and can turn it into a real rough night. Instead, it was a rough night in that dugout. Down now 14-7 after a seven-run second. Diamondbacks got two in the fourth, one in the sixth, and then four in the seventh. And here's D. Gordon. He has singled and walked, one for three. Seventeen hits for the D-backs. Now a season high. The previous high was the 16 back on March 31st against the Giants. That was the game they lost And if you include tonight's ball game, 
The Dodgers have scored at least six runs in 10 of their last 14 games here at Chase Field. The previous nine times they'd done so, they were all Dodger wins. So that trend is reversing itself here tonight. One and two on Gordon. Sanderson Ford bullpen, the left hander, Oliver Perez is warming. Most changeups we've seen Brad Ziegler throw in and out. And that last pitch was a slider, but uh, he's thrown three changeups in this sequence here to D. Gordon. Not unusual to see him use it against the lefty from time to time, but it's usually way down the list of priorities for Brad Ziegler. First, he needs to establish that sinking fastball, and then the frisbee slider, and the changeup is usually the third pitch that he works on in a ball game. It's a pitch that he really fell in love with last year and had a ton of success with. He actually uses the same grip that he used for the changeup when he threw overhand. And he's gone back to this grip and had a lot of success with it. A little flare out into left in Ciarte. Two down. It doesn't happen often, so we're glad we have it on tape. Clayton Kershaw hanging breaking ball. Middle of the plate fastball. Another middle of the plate fastball. Just making mistake after mistake. That wasn't a bad pitch. Chris Owings went down and got it. Another hanging breaking ball. He just couldn't seem to get his off-speed pitches in a location where the Diamondbacks couldn't get to him. Yeah, Seattle Puig. He homered in the third, his ninth of the year. He's one for four. He has struck out twice. Dodger fans, uh, well, they're still on their feet. A couple of bus loads made their way in today. And they at least watched Puig extend his now 16 game hitting streak. One and one. That's the unhittable strike right there. From that sidearm delivery, that comeback sinker that starts just off the outside corner at the knees, just tails back and nips the corner. Even if you swing at it, you can't do anything with it. One and two. Paints the outside corner with a sinker, comes back with a frisbee right in the middle of the plate, just freezes Puig that time. Able to lay off there, two and two. Puig hit under 280 in April, but he's over 420 in May. Got him. Third strikeout for Brad Ziegler. He strands the one out double. They're on their feet here at Chase. CenturyLink, your link to what's next. Coming up for the Diamondbacks. We'll see A.J. Pollock. He's already got three hits.
Bidding for the Dodgers, who trail the D-backs 14-7. Tuffy Gozawish will lead off the eighth for Arizona. Eric Chavez is in the on-deck circle. Pitcher spot is due up next. Tuffy, a pair of hits tonight. He's driven in a run. Anderson Ford bullpen Addison Reed trying to find that slider Scott Van Slyke has taken over for Yasiel Puig now playing right field two and one. Fourteen to seven sure looks like a football score. They don't have a football team in LA, do they? Well, that's an issue. They did. Nobody went. Actually, that is connected to the Dodger Stadium issue. With the new regime and the new ownership change in LA, they have all that money. Now there's been talk about, well, maybe it's time for a new Dodger Stadium. We got all that land in Chavez Ravine, but part of that theoretically has been reserved for a new NFL stadium so the the feeling is they're going to kind of wait and see what happens with the NFL and if they get a football team maybe they'll build a whole new complex up there with a couple of stadiums so that's kind of in limbo right now Eric Chavez will hit for Ziegler Chavez one for 14 is a pinch hitter this year. He laces that high and deep to left and out of here a home run. Eric Chavez, how about 15-7? There's that opposite field power. Eric Chavez at the age of 36, 17 years in the big leagues, and he can still take you the other way with some pop. Boy, dead low ball hitter. Whether it's inside or out over the plate, this time out over the plate, he went right with it to left field. Oh, so close, sir. <laughs> Third Diamondback home run. Owings in the fourth, Goldie in the seventh. Now Chavez, a pinch hit homer in the eighth. And A.J. Pollock is up looking for his fourth hit tonight. 15 runs on 18 hits for the Diamondbacks. And it's 0 2. Now, this is interesting. Drew Butera, the backup catcher, pitched for the Dodgers in a game this week against the Marlins. They had another game that got way out of hand. And so Butera was in there chucking for LA. He might get in there again. You ever pitch? I came close one time in a triple A game. <laughs> There's always a story. <laughs> I was actually warming up in the bullpen in Hawaii. Come on. No, I mean, it was. Oh, back in the PCL? Yeah, back in the PCL. Mm -hmm. It was one of these games like this. We were getting blown out. Our pitching staff was ragged. So Rocky Bridges sent me down to the bullpen to warm up, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on your point of view. We got out of the inning, and I never got the chance to actually get on the game mound. Well, I got this. This was Wednesday. In what turned out to be a 13 to 3 Marlins win at Dodger Stadium. There's Drew Buter, the backup catcher. He pitched one inning and had one strikeout. 11 pitches, eight for strikes. Pollock hits one high and deep and gone. A.J. Pollock, his fifth, and the hit parade continues. It 
It's a Diamondback ball game that has seen three triples in one inning and four homers tonight. It's 16 7. Chavez and Pollock go back to back. Three homers in the last two innings. If you count Goldie's back in the seventh. AJ Pollock out there. I'd love to see it. Earlier in the sequence, he swung at a pitch he thought he should have hit hard. He fouled it off and he was mad at himself. That's a real change in attitude for AJ Pollock, getting pitches that he feels like he should do some damage with and being frustrated because he didn't, but yet keeping his head in the game. Getting the same pitch later in the bat, and he didn't miss it the second time. Well, Rocky Bridges, you wanted it, you got it. Here comes the backup catcher to pitch for Los Angeles. Drew Butera is coming in at 16 7 Diamondbacks. For Don Mattingly, his sixth pitcher tonight is a catcher. And this is the second time in four games, in four days, pardon me, that backup catcher Drew Butera has had to pitch for the Dodgers. He worked one inning in a 13-3 loss to Miami on Wednesday. And here he is at it again <laughs> Saturday at Chase Field. Chris Owings first pitches into the seats. Uh, I'm laughing because I'm looking at a website that, uh, you know, Basically tells you the arsenal for every what's pitcher. he got. Oh my goodness <laughs> He's throwing a two seam fastball. He's throwing a slider. He's throwing a cutter a curveball a change up and a split In his one inning of work. Well, he's come in here and he's jumped ahead of Chris Owings 0 and 2 And in that one inning as we said early 11 pitches eight for strikes. He had a strikeout In fact, let's check out uh, Who is the big winner in the Butera strikeout sweepstakes? Back in that ball game. He struck out uh, Marcelo Zuna. Came in, got Yelich to line to center, got Lucas to ground a second, and then struck out Ozuna swinging. Well, the backup catcher hits 92 on the gun. Right field corner. That's a fair ball. It stays in play for Van Slyke, and Chris Owings is a single shy of the cycle. He has tripled, homered, walked, and now doubled. Only one rookie in Diamondback history had had a homer, a triple, and a double in a game. That was Justin Upton, August of 07. And guess who's up? <laughs> Go get him, kid. <laughs> The Diamondback individual game record for runs scored is 17. They've done that four times. The last was against the Rockies in 2002. Remember that game? No. <laughs> it's all a blur. It's all a blur. Well, when you score 17 runs, I mean, it goes by quick. Goldie hit a home run about a mile and a half his last time up. 
Drew Butera, the backup catcher, is pitching. It's 18 to 7. Ciarte, the hitter. Diamondback records. 18 runs on 21 hits. Gonzalez, the backhand stop there for the second out. Now watch the guy that catches the goalie homer. He's got a baby in one hand and now a baseball in the other. Wow, father of the year. Nice play. She doesn't look like she's enjoying it quite as much. What in the world is going on, Dad? <laughs> Martin Prado. Need one more base runner to get Gerardo Parra up there one more time on his bobblehead night. Well, you're like a dog with a bone. <laughs> <laughs> With that Goldie home run, the Diamondbacks on the night 10 for 20 with runners in scoring position. You put up numbers like that, you will get 18 runs. It's all good. Paul Goldschmidt, he came into the ball game hitless in five of his last seven. He was three for his last 26, but his home runs are our Chaz Roberts air conditioning cool plays of the game. Paul Goldschmidt tonight, Senator John McCain can't get enough. Goldie tonight, two doubles, two homers, a walk, six RBIs. He has scored five times. A lot of crooked numbers in that box score for Paul Goldschmidt tomorrow. And there's the gentleman that caught Goldie's home run ball on the fly with his bare hand with a baby in the other hand. Pictures all around surrounded by Dodger fans. The six RBIs for Goldie a career high. Addison Reed on in the ninth. It's 18 to 7. Hanley Ramirez, one for four. He singled his last time up. 
Diamondback team records. 18 runs on 21 hits. Broken bat. Shallow left. Owings wants it. A reminder, we will honor the anniversary of Randy Johnson's perfect game tomorrow. Randy will be here to throw out the first pitch. And as a refresher course, we will show you the big units perfecto against the Braves 10 years ago tomorrow. An encore broadcast right after the Diamondbacks live postgame show right here on Fox Sports Arizona. Not a bad way to send the big unit into his 10-year anniversary. We'll go from 18 runs to a perfect game. Adrian Gonzalez singles his last two times up. He's two for three. Well, it turned out to be quite an eventful day here at the ballpark. It all started this afternoon when Tony La Russa was named the Diamondbacks new chief baseball officer who will now oversee the entire baseball operations department and report to president and CEO Derek Hall. Any decisions made about baseball personnel will now go through that man who will be inducted into the Hall of Fame this July. Gonzalez shoots that one down the left field line and foul. Tony La Russa watching this ball game tonight is probably going, well, what's the problem? <laughs> I know. Why'd you call me? <laughs> what do you want me to fix exactly? Well, pace of game is always a discussion. <laughs> Some places more than others. We are approaching the longest nine-inning game at Chase Field, which is three hours and 58 minutes. Right now, this is the fourth longest game. We need about uh, seven more minutes. A couple of foul balls, and it'll be there. A lot of fireworks here at the ballpark. Had fireworks last night. A ball and two strikes to Gonzalez. Again, he shoots it to left, but this time Enciarte has it. And there are two down for Matt Kemp. Center fielder, Matt Kemp. A big day at Chase. A new chief baseball officer, Gerardo Parra, bobblehead day. More than 36,000 fans in attendance. Paul Goldschmidt, a career high, six RBIs, a Diamondbacks record, five runs scored in a game. And oh, by the way, he started off by striking out against Kershaw in the first. <laughs> After that, double, walk, double, homer, homer. Strike one. Tacos. Taco. And, forgot and tacos. Pizza tomorrow. I mean, come on. And don't forget Chase Anderson. In two major league starts is now 2-0, or will be in a minute. A long list of firsts tonight. Chase Anderson, just the second D-back rookie to win his first two starts, joining Geraldo Guzman in 2000. And Anderson Reed trying to nail it down for him. A strike away. This is now the second longest nine-inning game in Chase Field history. And we're still going. Well, Bobby, if you're going to have a night like this, just get the record. Left 
outfielder Carl Crawford. Now we're checking our watches up here. How are we doing on time? We are. I can't say that. He shoo, he who shall go unnamed. Handing me a series of statistics, most of which are irrelevant. Carl Crawford. Strike one. Well, who knows what's in store for tomorrow? That's baseball. Friday night, one team wins seven nothing. The next night, the other team wins eighteen to seven. And in a matchup of a guy who's won two Cy Youngs and a guy who started two major league games, it was the Cy Young guy who was chased. We need four minutes to tie the longest nine inning game ever here. <laughs> Tony La Russa was telling Derek Hall, my work here is done. Nice work. <laughs> Yeah, I would say so far for our new chief baseball officer, so far so good. And we think we need to get to we need to get to 908, right? All right, so we're under the four minute mark. Maybe we should have Tuffy go out and talk uh, yeah. to Addison Reed. Can we signal down there? What do you want to throw on this one two pitch? Let's really think about it. Records 18 runs on 21 hits, and they even the series with the Dodgers. And so far, the La Russa era is 1 0. Well, Bob, where do you want to start or finish? How about the offense? Good call. I'll tell you, AJ Ellis's ears have to be ringing tonight. There was a lot of solid contact up and down the lineup. Especially those guys at the top of the order. This is one of the prettiest scorecards I've ever seen. Well, 